Anybody needs a manual? You guys all have your manual? Yeah, the manual's in the back. Also, if you want to be too cool for school like Micah, I guess you don't need a my name tag. Oh, come on. The name tags are for two reasons. First of all, I really do want to learn your names. A lot of you, like, like I know, I've met, and I, we forget each other's names all the time, right? But secondly, I want you guys to meet each other. One of the coolest things, like, one of the coolest things about training classes is oftentimes you meeting other people and making friends and seeing ballers that, that I, heart, I see like once a year, Richard, that comes in and comes to very few trainings. But when he's here, that's a guy everybody should get to know because he slings a lot of real estate and has a lot of side hustle and would be good for everyone to know. And so make friends in this class. We'll have a few opportunities probably to just kind of mingle and just shake somebody's hand, get to know them, meet them. These are opportunities come from classes like this. Uh, so that's why I like doing name tags. Um, so a few other things. So uh, uh, I, let me just do a, a check first of all. Uh, we are going to have a Zoom element to the class today. <clears throat> uh, Zoomers, can you hear me? Caden, Rodney, anybody, will you just yep. in and say yes or no? Yep, can hear you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, you guys might get the shaft a little bit today, and here's why. Uh, you guys will be able to hear my voice, uh, but we're <clears throat> it's a little bit too much effort, and we've got uh, a couple of our microphones aren't working, so I'm not going to be passing the microphone around to people making comments. So I'll try to repeat people's questions or repeat their answers so that you guys can hear them the best I can. Otherwise, class, just talk loud, and hopefully the mic can pick up on me, can pick up as much as possible. Um, if Zoomers, if you get bored, drive over here. We've got a big group. We've got a big group here today, and it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Zoom's always a little challenging with the whole mic situation. Is that fair? We're okay with that? All right. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Clay Winder. You guys, uh, I'll do a little more introduction later because I want to do an illustration on probably one of the biggest challenges of being a realtor. And so I'm going to share a little bit more of my story. Uh, but in a nutshell, I'm an associate broker here at Keller Williams. I have been with KW since its inception. There's uh, four of us really that are all that's left. I got my license in 2007 uh, and joined, I, I interviewed a bunch of brokerages, but ended up joining KW up in Salt Lake City because that's the only place it was. It was in Midvale. And I joined that because there was a conversation up there that said, hey, we're going to incubate here in Midvale, and then we're going to open up Utah County. And at the time, I was a UVU student, and uh, I thought that's kind of exciting uh, to be part of the, this new Keller Williams franchise office down in Utah County. There was a smaller little brokerage called Westfield up in Highland. If you guys uh, have ever been to Highland, you'll notice that there's a neighborhood called Westfield, and there's a road called Westfield Road. That little brokerage was named essentially after that one little neighborhood. But the owners of Westfield and some KW brokers ended up merging and creating KW Westfield. And we were opened up first originally in Highland. A lot of people don't realize this story. Uh, this was 15 years ago. It was 2007. So was that 14 years ago? Um, so we opened up in Highland. And it immediately took off because KW was the disruptor at that time. There was no concept of a capping model. Every other brokerage just had, you know, an endless, an endless split, so to speak. Um, and it took off really fast and we got so big we needed more space. And so they eventually moved down to Orem on the other side of Winco. And then here four years ago, we built this building and, and moved into this building, which is nice because there's not too many real estate brokerages that actually own the building that they operate out of, but we do here. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I got my broker's license pretty quick. I challenge all of you guys, get your broker's license. It doesn't change your business a whole lot, but it does give you further education and it gives you some authority. Uh, and I run a sales team here called the Red Sign Team. And we sell a lot of houses and we hope to sell a lot more. Uh, but uh, uh, we've been with KW since the day, since the, since the beginning. I have not been with any other brokerage. This is like, I bleed red apparently, huh? It's uh, been good. But Keller Williams grabbed my heart pretty early on as a new agent because when I met with the team leader at the time, they essentially said, listen, there's a couple of things that, that are important and it stuck out to me. And one was when they said, we're a training and consulting company 
that happens to be in real estate. And as a new agent, and a lot of you are new, raise your hand, who's under a year? Okay, we've got a handful of under a year. When you're like drinking from the fire hose, right? You get out of real estate school and you're like, that taught me absolutely nothing about business. Taught me some law, like a little sliver of real estate law, but it doesn't really teach you actually how to do the business. And so KW comes along and says, hey, we're a training and consulting company. We're gonna teach you the business acts, you know, the business aspect and actually show you how to go make money. So we all get thrown this Bible, right? The red book, who's read it? Raise your hand high and proud. He knocked it out. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, give it a whirl, sink your teeth into it. Because one of the biggest complaints about real estate is people get overwhelmed with the business on how to create it. Well, there's four models. The wheel has already been created for you. Gary went out and he interviewed every single mega agent at the time back in 2005, 2006, when this book came out and said, listen, the models are there. There's four models. They're all in this book. Start reading. And this book is absolutely still applicable today. So we'll go over a, a lot of things in reference back to this book uh, quite a bit. Um, so my question for you uh, before, we get, before we dive into everything is, it, did, did anybody come to this class with a mission? Meaning like there's something very specific and particular that you want to get out of this class that we should declare now so that we make sure that we touch on it. Did anybody come here with a mission? Jake, why did you come? Because I need a more listing focused business. A more listing focused business. Awesome. Okay. Who else? Why'd you come? Yeah. That and I get a lot of, yeah, that's about my house. Where do I go? Where do I go? Everything there. So you mean like the, the exit strategy? I want to sell my house, but I'm, Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Bryson, why are you here? Uh, I think because just how hard it is to get somebody on the market. Oh, amen. What is our number of listings done the last three years in a row? On the MLS, if you look at just overall listings sold on the MLS, how has it looked the last three years? Almost four years, frankly. Come on, you guys know your numbers. What have our listings been doing? Flat, even down last year, we finally went up a hair this year, but we flatlined. There's this, there's, we're, we're selling the same amount of homes now as we were four years ago. Our inventory hasn't changed. Has our population changed? Has our agent count changed? Yes. Which means what? More it's the most competitive it's ever been in the real estate industry in my entire career. So new agents, welcome to the business. But that's exactly right, Bryson. <clears throat> listing, listing, listing. It's the, the right way to build a business. Who else? Great, and I'm picking on you. You've been in this class before. Why are you back? Well, just uh, sharpen my skills, you know, get current, relevant knowledge about the market. Awesome. How to help sellers, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason I started teaching this class, and it was for that reason. I realized years ago I wanted to build a listing business. I wanted to be the best listing agent I could be. And as the age-old adage says, if you want to learn something the best, teach it. So I sunk into this class. I watched it taught by uh, national people to really see how, how they taught it. And I've now taught this class probably five or six times, maybe more, um, because I want to stay sharp. I want to keep doing it. And honestly, as a teacher... When we get into some of these discussions, it's amazing how much I also learn from you guys. Um, I invite you guys, if I say something that you think is total BS, call me out. Because I will say something, you're like, I don't think that's right. Raise your hand and say, Clay, explain yourself. Because that doesn't sound quite right. Like, let's get into those. Because there are shifts and disruptions happening. And uh, we want to address these things. Okay? Anything else that we need to cover today? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think just approaching that and like letting them know how much value we have, like how to handle that in the best way. Who here would like to, to review the objection handler? Hey, Ben, I'm thinking about listing with homie over you. Why should I pick you over homie? You 
want to sell house Look at he's already going for the answer. You guys want to tackle tackle that one? Who's who's ever heard that objection before? Right? If you haven't, you will this week, everybody. Um, cool. Okay, so anything else before we start diving into the stuff? All right, so we are going to, like I said, we're going to skip a few things in the manual. However, the one thing I don't want to skip are the Gary Keller quotes. So I need a dedicated Gary Keller. Uh, Bryson, are you going to be here all day? Do you mind if we pick on you? Anytime we're about to review a quote that's a, a Gary Keller or an MREA, which is the book, Millionaire Real Estate Agent, will you just stop me and say, yo, there's a quote, let's read it. Is that fair enough? Because I want to go over those. So I think your manuals are the same as mine. Uh, but now that we have our Gary Keller, we are going to jump in to a quick vision exercise. Everyone put your phones down, put your phones down. And I want you guys to just do a silly little exercise, but I want to get our mindset right. I want you to close your eyes. We'll do this fast. Close your eyes. You can do a little visual. Imagine yourself a year from now. You walk into your office Monday morning and see a stack of leads you will call. You call each one, connecting with them effortlessly, saying the right things, exploring how you can help. You're confident that you'll set appointments with many of them. After your calls, you have five appointments booked and a solid follow-up plan for the rest. In fact, you have already done your homework for each seller and know what pricing you'll recommend. All of your appointments go well and you assign all except for one. You didn't feel it would be a great match, so you refer them to another agent. Four new clients in a week is a big win that boosts your motivation. Your motivation is even higher as you attend two closings that afternoon. That feeling of motivation and success propels you every day. Open your eyes. Grab your pen and answer this first question. What do you enjoy most about working with sellers? This is page, I think, eight. At least it is in mine. Turn to page eight. Just like in one word, just keep it short. But what do you enjoy about working with sellers opposed to buyers? Jot it down. What do you enjoy most about working with sellers? Then I'm going to go to the second question. What are some of the challenges with working with sellers? And then we're not going to go to the next two questions yet. Micah, why do you like, I'm picking on some of the veterans, by the way, guys. I think Micah's been in the business about as long as I have. Probably longer. Maybe? Similar? 15 years? Well, then you have some, then, then this is an important question. Why do you like working with sellers? It's a consistent, predictable business, you might say. Awesome. Dan, why do you like working with sellers? Awesome. Awesome. Um, who else can I pick on for number two, the challenges? Challenges. Dan Hernandez, what are some of the challenges with working from, with some sellers? You've had, you've had your fair share of challenges. Dan, I can smell your cat litter box. We need to address that. That's always a fun conversation, right? Yeah. What else? What are some of the challenges with working with a seller? You guys spread out way too big. I'm not even rolling this screen today. I was hoping to keep everybody on this side. This unrealistic expectation. Uh, my favorite marriage quote goes along with my favorite being a listing agent quote, which is all frustration comes from unmet expectations. So if you want to keep your sellers happy and not frustrated, set the right expectations. And that is hard to do. The other quote that I shared just the other day that resonates well with me all the time is it's our job as realtors 
to translate the market data in a way for our sellers and our buyers to make good decisions, right? We are the translators of the market. And that's exactly for that purpose, to set the right expectations. So when you have somebody that says, oh, I'm sure my $500,000 house is really worth 650, we get to be the bearer of bad news that educates them on why that's just simply not the case and why they will be very frustrated if they have that expectation. That makes sense? So let's go to this next one. What is your, and this is important, you guys, what's your business goal for this year for listings? What is your listing business goal? It might be a number. I want to help this many families sell their homes. It might be, I want to refer this many. I'm thinking of you, Camille. If you're not in the listing business, you might be referring listings because you, you work there. But what's your listing business goal? And if you don't have one, gosh dang it, declare it right now. What do you want to do this year? How many is it going to be? Okay, who thinks they've got the highest goal in the room? Anyone over 20? Raise your hand. Wait, raise your hand higher. We've only got two people that want to sell more than 20 homes this year. All right, guys, we're going to change that. Gosh dang it. Um, you guys will learn real quick in this book that the path to making the most amount of money in this business is running a listing business for the exact reasons that Micah said. You do 20 listings this year, it'll feel like a part-time job. You do 20 buyers this year, you are working 40 hour weeks every single week. You guys hear me? I got some head nods, you know what I'm talking about. So the idea of leads, listings, leverage that's taught in this book is absolutely to save our time and manage a business that's consistent and predictable, right? And so the quicker we can get doing more listings than buyers, the better. So let's jump into a few other things. Uh, Gary Keller over there, do you mind reading that quote nice and loud? mindset. So Gary's a, a creature of learning, right? This guy is like a college professor. He, he just does research, 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 and then teaches. So here he's traveled the world. He's still doing it constantly. He's interviewing top agents. And here he is. We're about to, we're, we're about to dive into the nuts and bolts of a whole class. And his first thing says, you got to just spend a second and just get in the mindset of thinking like a listing agent. And that really is one of the primary goals of this class is I want you guys to start that mental shift from thinking I'm a buyer's agent because I get it. Buyer's agents, buyer agency is easier. We all know that. If you just hustle, usually you can pick up business. Listing is not as, as easy. You have to actually go earn it, right? You have to have a resume. You have to get hired. Whereas buyers just isn't the same. So it takes a mental shift. And so that's what Gary is saying here is you first have to get clear up here and committed up here that, hey, I want to pursue being a listing agent and not just chase deals, right? Well, that's what we're doing here. So agents who succeed at a high level with sellers are persistent, dedicated, and consistent in their business. They have worked with enough sellers to be able to anticipate and handle almost every type of scenario with ease. According to our research, top listing agents commonly excel in following areas. They priority prioritize and manage their leads. They know their sellers, their decision facilitators. They master their scripts. They hire a coach for accountability. They know their numbers, use time efficiently and effective, leverage technology, and they embrace these six personal perspectives that we have on the wall. And hopefully you guys have started to get to know those and actually understand how to apply those principles in your life. And we're not going to go through all of them in this class, but it's in Ignite. We usually touch on those in, in most classes. Um, does that make sense? This is the mindset. I'm hoping that by the time we leave today, a lot of us have that commitment and that excitement around building a listing business. So go to page 11. So you guys should be looking at this wheel. This is what we're going through, the seven-step seller service cycle model. So a lot of you guys have to ha might have to leave early or you might have to do whatever. And again, like I said, we're not even gonna go through every page of this book, but this can literally serve as your manual for listings because we're gonna go over each step of the listing process and you guys can reach back to this one. It's like, holy smokes, I might be getting a listing. What do I do? And you're gonna panic. Well, dust off this book, go through it because this is the manual on how to sell a house the right way. All right, 
So, and depending on how we go today, we'll probably do lunch if we're looking at this like as a timetable, probably somewhere around number four and five, the servicing and marketing portion of our day, okay? But like I said, I'm gonna go really, really fast. So, uh, Ben, will you just read, uh, we've got some truths that are speckled in the book. Uh, read the truth for me. We'll pick on this periodically too. This sort of cycle represents knowing the basics, systematizing the business, getting better over time and working towards that. Awesome. What is mastery, Ben? To you. To me? Yeah, like what's mastery? When somebody says mastery in, in, in the context of business, of being a great realtor, what does that mean? To being confident in being able to approach any objection, to be able to take them as a, as a guide versus constantly having to check with somebody else. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is important. We've got, we've got mastery as one of the six personal perspectives. And I think this is important because sometimes our approach to business isn't the same approach that we have to other things in life, but it should be. If you want to be a master listing agent, it's going to take everything you just described. The difference between Donovan Mitchell shooting a free throw and me shooting a free throw is pretty subtle. If you think about it, I know how to do it. I know what to do. I know why to do it. So does Donovan, but he, his, his shot ratio is far better than mine, right? Because of mastery. And so sports is always a good analogy of like how much practice do they do compared to game time, game play, right? It's hours and hours and hours of practice for just one hour of game, game time. And I want you guys to adopt that principle in your business. If that's why we're in this classroom, we need to master these things here in the classroom so that when it's game time and you're sitting in a living room, you are sharp and you win that listing. Yeah. So Clay, this was shared at a family reunion like three years ago. It's funny, we just just mentioned this in my networking group the definition of mastery let's hear it what is the definition of mastery doing something un doing something uncomfortable often enough where not doing it becomes uncomfortable mm. gosh i love that Sends chills down. guys i haven't been in a listing appointment in three weeks i feel uncomfortable no nah, i'm not there yet <laughs> shoot you got to keep working so on be it be uncomfortable be uncomfortable for sure. Well, and that's why I say the difference between buyer agency and, and listing agency is far different. When you hook up with some buyers who already have a handful of homes that they want to go look at, pretty comfortable, right? You just got to like make it happen. You don't even have to talk about yourself really. If you can get them in the door, be a great negotiator, actually show up, that's a pretty like comfortable situation. But when somebody calls you and says, hey, Richard, I want to list my house, but I'm interviewing four different companies. You're one of them, but I'm also going to interview Homie. I'm going to, I'm going to interview, what's that? Yeah, I'm going to, or I might just sell the open door. Um, but I'm also going to meet with Micah in your office. So come and tell me why you're different, why I should choose you among those four. If that doesn't give you a few butterflies, I don't know what does in this business. You should have some nerves. But we can get around those nerves by having confidence where you can say, oh, I'm going to whoop open door and homie. Those are easy. Micah could be tough to compete with, but I am different than Micah. And I'm going to have a crystal clear presentation on why I'm different and why I'm potentially a better match for them than Micah. What? Impossible. Right? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, you joke, but that, that's happened to me once, my career. Me and Dan Kennedy had the same listing. And when we found out, Dan said, you know what? I don't know if I even want this one. I'll just call him and tell him to list with you. And he did. And I got it. It was great. It was, no, we did it. So when we got, when that came up again, because we were in the same uh, Dave Ramsey thing, another one came up and I threw him a bone into the same thing for him. It was kind of funny. So, um, all right. Sorry. I told you we're going to go down a few, a few bunny trails. Turn to page 13. Turn to page 13. Let's check in with your business. Let's check in with your business. I want to see, let's see where you're at. So grab your pens and let's just do a self-evaluation. Check this box if, if you are currently doing it. So number one, do you time block and lead generate three hours a day? And that can count lead follow-up as well. But are you spending time communicating purposefully with any kind of database for three hours a day? If so, check the box. Do you have a database of METs? That's what we call like our SOI, our top 200. Do you have a database of METs and past clients and consistently communicate with them? And I'd add, we call that the 36 touch program. 
I'm going to use a lot of the Kellerisms, if that's what we can call it. So if I say something like 36 touch and someone's like, I have no idea what that guy's talking about, raise your hand and I'll go there. But this is also a little more of an advanced class. So I'm just going to like throw them out and tell you guys they stop. I have no idea what you mean by Y4C2Ts or whatever the, we have so many analogies in this company. It can kind of get annoying, but we have them anyway. Have you taken Ignite or Bold at least once? Check that box. You practice and you use scripts from Ignite or Bold. This is for the, the more experienced. Have you been in business two years or more? And have you closed 16 deals or more? Ooh, thank you. Um, let me ask, who's sold more than, as a listing agent, more than 16? Can we just kind of identify how many, because I would call that pretty experienced. Of course you have, Stan, you have. We only have the three? Oh, come on, there's more. Come on, Shona, you've done more. Okay, there's a, there's a handful of people in here that have done more. That's good. Um, do you use KW Tech? You have a business website that attracts and captures customer inquiries. You have an online presence that can bring you leads. You active use, yeah, everyone uses social media. Set goals for the number of appointments and listings that you need per day. I'm gonna ask that again. Do you have a goal around listing appointments? And on that head, are you immersed in the market center? Check that box. Have you attended mega camp? Number 12, have you attended family reunion? Probably about half this room just did, congratulations. And do we have anybody here in MAPS coaching? Check that box. So my question here is simply, did anybody get more than half of those checked? Is anybody more than half? Dan, okay, so we've got, we've got some in here, okay. The rest of you, if you're less than half, we got a lot of work to do. The reason I like going through this is it kind of frames what the top listing agents are doing in their business. That's it in a nutshell, really. If you have all 13 of those marked, you've got your accountability with a MAPS coach, you're attending these trainings, you're lead generating three hours a week, you're on that path to being a great listing agent, right? All right, guys, page 15. These are silly, but I always like touching on it. There's three types of students you can be today, the prisoner, the vacationer, or the explorer. I am actually fine with you being any of the three. If you are here just because you're on vacation, which means you have to be here, you don't want, or excuse me, the prisoner, you have to be here. You, is anybody a prisoner here today? You probably are, because Becca made you come here. Just kidding. Yes, that's what I like to hear. Camille's probably a prisoner because she was told to come to this class. Just kidding. A lot of you might be vacationers and you're just here because you don't want to work today. You're just here because you want to learn, right? Whatever. And then finally, the explorer is what I hope all of you are and you're actually here to learn. The reason why I say this is because my teaching style is, is a little bit more flexible. If you guys are on your phones, on your laptops, I don't care. The only thing I do care about is that you don't disrupt the class. So if you need to step out to take a call, that's fine. Just step out if you're annoying people, whatnot. I've even got Jordans on my laptop to text people back. We're all realtors. We get it. Capital R. Everyone plug your ears. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Go in. All right. Story time. Story time. Uh, I want to show you. I want to illustrate a, a challenge that we've always we've 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 already touched on a little bit. The challenge of becoming a listing agent uh, is absolutely real. So I'm just going to kind of show my history real quick, and I want you guys to share what ahas you see out of the, the production. So like I said, I got started in 2007. Literally, my license was January 3rd, 2007. 2007 will be probably the most studied year in human history, is, is my opinion. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you've read books on the year 2007, you'll learn that that was the year that the destruction of man was born. You know what I'm talking about? 
AI was born in 2007, officially. Cloud computing and AI. It's also the year the iPhone came out. This is like not even important for the class, but it was a good year, right? So 2007, uh, I get started in real estate. What happened in 2007 in the real estate industry? Took a dump, right? So uh, a lot of things caused that, and we're not gonna do a market class, but I think it's important to understand shifting markets. There's a reason Gary Keller wrote a book called Shift, and it was because of this, but I was too naive. I was 21 years old, UVU student, uh, uh, took the classes at UVU to get into uh, just on real estate. And halfway through the class, our teacher said, oh, by the way, this satisfies your 120 hours. So if you want, you can take the test at the end and get licensed. And I thought, that's interesting. I didn't think I wanted to be a real estate uh, licensee, but maybe I'll check it out and see what that's all about. At the time, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I thought, why not? So I went through it, I got started uh, because everybody was making like crazy amounts of money in 2006. And I saw some young guys that were making like a lot of money. And I thought, well, that's exciting. I like money, I'll go get into real estate. But I had my eyes open real quick. When I get in January 3rd, I start taking this, cl this class called Camp 443. Uh, it's now called Ignite. Who here has graduated from Ignite? Proud Ignite graduates, yes. So I get into Ignite and they start teaching us the real fundamentals of the 10-4. What are the 10-4? Who just raised their hand? Caroline, what's the 10-4? You remember? Oh my goodness. Who's got the 10-4? Come on, Adrian. So you add 10 contacts, you then talk to them 10 times. 10 thank you notes a day. Visit 10 properties or at least review 10 properties online through the MLS. Guys, by the way, that's like the fundamental, like in 2007, that's still the fundamentals today. That will be the fundamentals of, a, of an agent's uh, business in 20 years from now. You talk to 10 people a day, you're going to sell houses. You write 10 thank you cards a day, you're going to develop good rapport with, with people. And you review 10 houses a day, you're going to learn the market. If you're not doing that right now, change your habits, change your ways. I literally have already reviewed my 10 houses before this class because every single day I get my alerts from the MLS. I monitor them. I check them out. And if I see something that matches the criteria of my buyers, I copy, paste it, text it over, say, yo, can I show you this house later this afternoon? Every single day, this is what we do, right? Make your 10 calls, get your stack of thank you cards, or write them. So I start doing this process in 2010. And right out the gates, I get a listing appointment from my old college roommate who bought a townhome uh, and a year later decided, hey, I'm going to go join the Marines. Uh, so that was a very exciting process because I had no idea what I was doing. I was still in Ignite. I showed up at his house with a sign because I thought that's what we were supposed to do and a listing agreement. And I put the sign up in the yard. I walked in and he said, yeah, I'll sign with you. But, but what price are we going to do? I had no idea. I hadn't taken a CMA class. So I said, I'm going to get back to you on the price, um, but I'm going to still put up my sign because I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, he signed the listing agreement. I came running back to the office. I went to the bullpen is what we used to call it. But you guys all know the day desk areas where everyone's kind of huddled. Graydon's there every single day. And I run in there with my Ignite friends and I say, guys, I got a listing agreement. What in the heck do I do? And how cool is it? KW has a great culture of help. I immediately had people that said, congratulations, that's great. Let's price it. Let's figure out your plan. When are you going to do photos, this and that. So I start on that process. The next day, I look at my email, I already have two offers. I didn't even put it on the MLS yet, right? And I thought, well, that's crazy. It was from the two neighbors on sandwiching the house. I had two offers from the two neighbors. That was the, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about now because it's back, that kind of market is back now. But I thought I was the coolest agent ever because I already had two offers and it wasn't on the MLS. But I was tasting the very last bit of the bubble, right? That was the bubble. But we got it on the MLS. We started rolling. I had my very first transaction within three months of being at KW uh, as, a, as a listing. And then I did nothing for five more months. My first six months in this business, I only sold that one little townhome. But it was cool. It was multiple offers. It was all that. But it was a little painful because I realized real quick that your first year in real estate is tough. Success your first year in real estate is just surviving, frankly. But I kept doing the 10-4. I implemented a 36 touch and I was able to get six more transactions. Well, I guess seven more transactions in the second half of the year, almost one a month. And it started to come together uh, as a business. But I share that first year just because I know a lot of you that raised your hand that you're under a year, you're suffering through that first year grind right now. Yeah. At that point, 
Brandon Fugel is the most successful realtor on planet Earth, according to the stats we can pull. Like the highest net worth or something like that. He's just done more. He's done more transactions under his license, I guess is kind of what that's defined as, than like any other realtor on Earth that we can find. And he's right here in Utah. That's why you look at Brandon Fugel, you're like, is he our governor? Like you'd think he was a politician with his signs everywhere. Yeah, but he sacrificed a lot for it. He's an interesting guy to listen to because he'll talk about he sacrificed. And, you know, you read the books Driven, Larry Miller, all those. A lot of those successful guys, they sacrifice their families. They'll sacrifice a lot of important things in their life uh, in order to achieve that kind of volume. And, you know, we've all got to make that, that decision in life if we're going to do that. Um, but yes, uh, a lot of you, I won't have you raise your hands, but I know you're starving right now. And here we're talking about listings, and it's what's going to pull you out of the rat race. So year two, though, look, I get momentum. So if you can't tell right here, this is the number of transactions. So we get up to 26 deals, 21 buyers. Check it out, though. I've got some sellers going. You know, a lot of that's happening. Um, but I learned real quick when that all started to happen uh, that I needed to learn short sales. If you guys don't know what short sales are, they're getting, they'll come back someday, but short sales are when a seller says, hey, I want to sell my house. I do a CMA and I say, well, it's worth 450. How much do you owe? And they say, oh crap, I bought it for 550 and I still owe 500. And I'm looking at the number saying, well, it's only worth 450. You're 50 grand short of what you owe to the bank. So are you going to write a check? No, I can't. Then we have to negotiate with the bank to forgive that 50 grand. And that's why it's a short sell. The bank's going to eat their shorts and take that loss, All right? Yeah, they got to eat their shorts. That's why it's a short sell. And it has nothing to do with time. Short sales take very long. The fastest I've ever done a short sale is three months. The longest was 36 months. And the average is always about a year. Who's done a short sale lately? Anyone? Have you done one lately? It's been two years since my last short sale, which obviously, if somebody's upside down right now, WTF. I don't know how that's possible when the market's doing this. I was going to say, though, but wait five months because everyone's refinancing right now, right? And they're milking every dime out of their house so they can go buy that boat and RV. If we have even a slight softening, short sales are back, and I will be cleaning up. They are fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to skip through a couple of these years, but I want you guys to see the trend. Stop here at, at, at 2015. So this is the number of buyers that's going, right? This is the number of sellers. Notice what's happening is career advances. Remember, I'm starting it as a 21-year-old. You'll start to see a trend happen where I'm getting good at real estate, right? But like, it's <laughs> tough when all of a sudden I have my, my greatest year, 2012, which also was literally the bottom of the market. I can still remember the February 2012, one of these listings, one of these listings right here, I put it on the market and I had multiple offers. And it literally was the only time I had had multiple offers really on a listing since that very first one that first year. There were no such thing as multiple offers in the recession. You put up a listing and I'd say, all right, it's probably gonna take about a year to sell and we might have to beg and give away the farm to get an offer to actually stick and close. Did you, did you feel shady? Shady? Like, Yeah, it was weird because even the buyers were like, hmm. But remember, the average purchase price, I'm following that. I mean, look at 2012. Guys, this was, and this was, my, this was my average purchase price, right? Am I looking at this right? Yeah, I mean, this was, this, I'm house, like, I, yeah, I'm a poor kid from West Valley. And a lot of these ones were like trailers and, and stuff. But still, like, I was still selling normal houses. And this was the average sales price. It's fascinating, right? Um, but I had multiple offers and I was like, wow, this is different. So the shift happens 2012 and I go and have the best year of my life. And I finally get rich in real estate, right? You go close 61 deals. And it was just me and a, and a TC. It was like a, those of you that use Jen Gray or somebody, I just had a, a, a not even a full-time assistant, just a transaction coordinator. And I thought, okay, this is awesome. I finally, like, it took five years to kind of figure it out, but I'm going to go start buying more rental properties and start formulating my wealth journey. Right. I was because these first year, I mean, I was in credit card debt. Like when I renewed, like when I did all the licensing, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's like credit card. It's like this is a commitment to make this a make this a career. But then I had a really good year where it's like, okay, I'm out of debt, or at least out of the debt from getting in the business. 
start paying the bills. And as many as this sounds, this isn't a lot of money when uh, you know, your purchase price is, is pretty low. And remember, a lot of these short sales and stuff were two percenters. And we're kind of getting back to that right now for other reasons. Well, let's see it. You know, 2.8. So it wasn't terrible, but it's 2.8. It was kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, but then things really started to take off and tease up for the amazing 2013. So 2013, out of that 116 deals, 110 of those were just me. So then I really got rich, right? And I'm not sharing that to brag. I'm sharing that to hopefully inspire you guys to like, when you really start to get going in this business, you close that kind of, kind of volume, you're buying multiple rental properties. You're funding a pretty exciting life. And it was stressful. Um, I had a lot of crap in my own life. I got divorced that year, not because of that. I think I did 100 and, 110 deals because I was going through that part of my life. Um, and a note on that, there's probably not too many careers more stressful on relationships than real estate because re real estate requires so many after hours uh, of work, right? And so getting real clear with your spouse uh, on like the requirements of being in real estate is so, so important. It just kills me when I hear of divorces in this office and having, and I, and I'm one of those stat, stats. It's, it's really challenging. Um, anyway, that's one of those bunny holes we could do a whole class on, right. On how this business affects relationships. Um, but that's also the year I was so busy. I thought, okay, I'm going to like die. If I, if I'm that busy, 110 deals all on my plate, was crazy, but that was also the year that I, I did two things. And that's when essentially the team was born officially, Red Sign Team. I had hired Cameron Wilson, who a lot of you guys know, he's still here today, he's upstairs working as my assistant. Uh, and then I also hired, which is really fun, Steph Ashby. A lot of you guys know Steph Ashby. She's on our staff, she's the assistant team leader. She was my first official buyer's agent. I had hired, uh, as I was doing this, I had grabbed some igniters and said, hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks. Just go open doors. Whether you open one door or 50 doors, it's 500 bucks. So get lean, go show my buyers. But the minute they say, I want to buy that one, come back to me. I'll write up the rep C. I'll do it and I'll pay you 500 bucks. So I had three people doing that for me. They're called showing assistants. I had Cameron Wilson as my right-hand guy. And then I graduated one of those showing assistants to be my full-time buyer's agent glued to my hip. And that was Steph Ashby. She is one of my favorite people. You guys need to get to know her. Her office is upstairs, but she works for the KW staff right now. But that's when I share that because the rest of these numbers, I started doing less personally and trying to grow through the team model, which the team model, of course, is explained fairly well in the Red Book. Now, some of you guys have aspirations to create a team. Awesome. Many of you are on teams. Awesome. And there's a lot of you that say, you know what? I have no desire to go through the, the process of actually managing people. I'd rather just run a great lean and mean business and get up to that 60 to 100 deals where I've got maybe a, a transaction coordinator with me, but that's it. And guys, that's a great business. I personally put more money in my pocket in this year than I did this year because I was growing the team. I had to kind of take that step back and share that commission dollars with team members in order to continue the growth. So I only share that because team is a constant conversation here at KW because this is the place for teams to grow, um, but it's also not right for everybody. So a lot of you are on that journey. Yeah. How did Johnny come into this whole mathematical Yeah, great question. So Johnny was a part of this number. So for those of you that know, Johnny Christensen is our OP for this office. He hides, so a lot of you probably don't even know him. Uh, but Johnny and I partnered up Early on in these days, when he got started, he had done like two of these 26 and then maybe four of those 48. Johnny wasn't necessarily a great, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Johnny is like, uh, his personality is a little hard for this business because he has pretty much zero patience, right, Shoni? And so, and in this business, we do a lot of butt kissing. I call it butt kissing, but it's like customer service, like <laughs> crazy, right? Like we have to take care of people. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, Johnny's great with people, uh, but it was, it was here in 2010, after these two years of us cranking away in 2010, uh, this office, we're in the middle of the recession and Westfield darn near went bankrupt. We had a, an OP that, that did a couple of really foolish deals uh, with some sponsorships. You guys remember the flash basketball team that we had for like a minute 
here in Utah County. We wrote a big check to sponsor them. And then the flash like went bankrupt, as you guys recall, because of the recession. And we lost a lot of money on that deal. And uh, essentially, the team leader at that time bowed out. And the OP at that time said, guys, we got to mix things up. So we came to me and Johnny and said, hey, you guys are young. You're, you're, you're doing well. We had just done this year of 48 deals. And he said, is there any chance one of you would like to apply to be the team leader, which is Shoney's position right now? And that's when Johnny said, uh, uh, we both talked to Dorn and said, yeah, let's do it. So that's when we kind of uh, split tasks, I guess you will. And Johnny became the team leader of KW. And so then I, I kept doing production at this point. Now, people like to think that this went down because Johnny left. Not the case. I just lost my mind a little bit on trying to build teams because of the book. And I spent too much time hiring, getting into business with the wrong type of people. Uh, this was, you know, I'm like a 20 something year old. So I'm thinking, okay, I got to hire that assistant. So I would hire these like young college girls that were like fun and cool to hang out with, but they just weren't empire builders. I hired six assistants before finding Cameron Wilson, six. And I just kept hiring like task doers. And a lot of you are assistants in here. It's a hard thing to find that like yin yang relationship between sales agent and that admin support. And I was failing at that and I dabbled too much in it. That's why this year I said, I'm just gonna forget trying to build a team. I'm just gonna put my head down and go to work with just a, a, tra a per transaction, transaction coordinator. And that's when I, I just went out and just knocked this out and did it. But I was forced at that point to really hire that yin to my yang. And that's when I said, all right, enough like of thinking like an assistant. I need to think like an empire builder. I need to find somebody that wants to build their entire career with me in real estate. And I started interviewing those type of people, which also cost a little more. And that's when I found Cameron, a guy that had been out doing the summer sales and had already learned that he doesn't like doing sales. He likes being in a supportive role and being a systems person and had a vision of creating a career around that. And that's when that marriage formed and took off. <laughs> Questions about that. Is this helpful? I kind of want to go through because it illustrates next few years, which get tough. So this percentage right here is the percentage of my business that was sellers versus the percentage of business, which is buyers. So these years right here, where it's like 60 to 70%, 2015, 70% are buyers, only 30% sellers, again, is, is a very lopsided business. Who here is in that realm where about seven out of 10 of your transactions are all buyers and you're doing a couple listings? Raise it high and proud, right? That's most agents fall victim to this because listings are hard. Now, I'm not the most talented person out there. I'm a B student, an average guy. So I chase the quickest dollars, which usually falls in buyers. Right? It wasn't until I had to get really, really purposeful in, in taking these listings, which we started getting more um, to get there, but it was still very lopsided, right? And then fast forward to 2020. Now we start getting there. There's just, well, I'll just go to 20. I didn't finish out 2022, by the way or 2021, excuse me. So this needs to be updated. I didn't have time this morning to update it. Uh, but the, at the end of the year, it landed exactly 50. So last year was the first year of my entire career. What is that? 14, 15 years later, where I finally did a 50-50 business. 50% 50 of the business was buyers, 50% was sellers. But that shift started back here in 2018. What do you think happened in 2018 that helped all this happen? So little old me goes down to a family reunion or a mega camp. I can't remember which one it was. And I'm listening to these panels on the national stage talk about the opportunity of new construction. And we've been in, you know, the, the market's been hot since 2012. But then in 2018, it's like, well, is there going to be a shift soon? We kept talking like it's, it shifts happen every 10 years, uh, maybe sooner. So is there a shift coming? Uh, and, and, but, it, but it wasn't. And new construction was just kept getting pounded harder and harder and harder. The economy just kept growing and growing. And so in 2018, I made a very purposeful shift. You guys know priority, excuse me, personal perspective number three, move from E to P 
move from entrepreneurial, which means you're just winging it, chasing dollars, to purposeful. You have to have those breakthrough moments. I had that breakthrough moment where I said, I need to pull up my calendar and start saying no to stuff so I can go focus on builder relationships. And so I went out, I worked hard. It took about a year just to land some really good builders of relationships, whining, dining, the same thing you do with your SOI, waiting for the other realtor to mess up for me to have my opportunity uh, to get some FaceTime with these builders. And I was able to pick up a couple of builders, which just changed the name of the game. And when you are, a, when you are representing new construction in today's market, you are king. A lot of you have pursued some of the listings that I have on new construction. And you know what I'm talking about when I say, yeah, if you want this spec home, you're competing with 20 other offers. You guys are buying me pizza. You're sending me brownies, right? Like it's a crazy position to be in. I kind of like feel like God when you're listing new construction. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but I, I tell you guys this because honestly, like, go do it. Go do it. Fast forward to family reunion last week. Gary Keller did the vision speech. Right, The vision speech is where they review all the stats and numbers and try to have a little bit of a crystal ball moment on what to expect for this year. Gary Keller is wearing a very interesting t-shirt. Did anybody see what his t-shirt said? Gary wore a t-shirt that said, buy dirt on stage in front, of, in front of tens of thousands of people during the vision speech that said, buy dirt. That has not changed. So you better believe my focus that, that is happening right now is not just builders and new constructions, it's development, development, development. Listing a lot right now is more valuable in my mind than listing a house because of all the potential things I can do with marketing that lot and creating inventory with, with builder commission on the lot, commission on the build job, maybe I pick up a buyer and I use that to pre-sell other construction uh, inventory that's just not on the MLS, right? So hopefully all of you guys are having some ahas too on Ooh, new construction. It's great to just go sell your friends and edge home, but it's even greater to represent it. That makes sense? What other ahas do you guys see when you're looking at this? Some nice shifts have happened, right? This has been a nice thing. This is actually a little bit higher. Notice, though, that I've always been a little lower than the average. I don't know why. Maybe it's because when I started at 21, I've just done a lot of condos and whatnot. This is probably the most frightening number and we could, we could get a, on a whole soapbox on what in the heck are you guys doing to our industry? And yes, I'm looking at realtors. That's not homies fault. That's not the consumer's fault. That's agents that don't understand their own value have driven the commission rate down, down, down. Do you agree? In the absence of value, price becomes a determining factor. So when realtors are sitting in people's living room and they don't know their own value on why, that they're, why they're worth 3% to sell a house, they're quick to say, yeah, I'll just list it for 2%. I'll just list it for 1.5%. Oh, and by the way, buyer's agents, it's so easy to be a buyer's agent right now. You may as well just offer 2.5% on the BAC. That's plagued our business the last three years. The value of the realtor has diminished because they've done it to themselves. In the absence of value, excuse me, yeah, in the absence of value, price becomes the determining factor. That's in all things, right? Like we, we, we get that, but that's the plague of our, of our industry right now is realtors have decided their own value is not worth 3% anymore. We've done it to ourselves, yeah. Well, so when the, yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things, but you're, you're absolutely right. When it's easier to sell homes, then people lose the value, you know, pe people don't value the agent quite the same. A good example of that is Lennar Homes. Lennar Homes made a change last year in January. Remember what they did? 1%. They did all BAC at 1%. What did Edge do? That same month that Lennar made that announcement, what did Edge Homes do? They had a meeting up at the Edge headquarters where Steve Maddox invited all of us brokers that are involved in brokerages and got us on and said, I declare to you, I'm staying at 3% and I'm not going to change. And it's probably going to cost me about $16 million to do that. But I'm going to do that because I know when times get tough, I want you guys remembering this moment. And I don't know who's going to make it out more, Lennar or Edge, 
A hard thing is a lot of agents probably won't survive the business. We have a lot of turnover, so they might not remember that moment, but I sure as heck will remember that moment. And so when I'm doing my land deals and I've got a sweet piece of land that I know Lennar wants, and I know Edge wants, who do you think I'm gonna do a deal with? Yeah, it's interesting business we're in. Um, so the answer is yes, the market can do that. And guess what, guys? Lennar's selling just fine at 1%. And agents are either taking it in the shorts or they're actually developing their scripts and dialogues and their own value to say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, buying in a Lennar home will cost you a little more in closing costs. It'll cost you at least another 1% for me to be involved because they're not paying me at least 2% and that's my minimum threshold. And so keep in mind that if we pursue a Lennar home, you'll just have a little more in closing costs. You'll have an added 1% to cover me. Is that okay with you guys? Do we need to talk about why I'm valuable to you to represent you through a Lennar purchase, right? Yes. Yeah. So how or what can we do to go against it? You know, I mean, if the builder is the one that is creating all the value of them. Great, great point. So there's not a lot of builders doing it, but there are absolutely builders right here in Utah County, <coughs> Salisbury, that will say, <laughs> hey, cut out your cut out your buyer's agent and we're gonna give you a discount. So just call it what it is and talk to your buyers and ask your buyers this. Why would a builder want to cut out a buyer's agent? Number one, they want to save money. So even though the buyer thinks that they're going to get that money, they might get a portion of some savings, but the builder wants to save money. But why else would a builder not want a buyer's agent involved? Well, really, I mean, really what they're saying, they don't care about the relationship. Okay, so they definitely don't care about the relationship. They don't care about referrals. They don't care about guys like me that are, have drank the orange Kool-Aid and love Edge, right? <laughs> Do you think I refer anybody to Salisbury Home? No, because they've stabbed me in the back multiple times. You guys are all going to deal with the Salisbury deal. They actively tell people that they can save money by not having a buyer's agent. And they're, and they're not the only ones. There are other builders that do that. And sometimes it's the agents if they get bonus differently or whatnot. But why else? Why else would a builder not want a buyer's agent? Representation. Bingo. Because... Builders know that good buyer's agents will keep them accountable. They'll knot their ankles when they make mistakes and they'll, they'll get in the way. They can't, they can't be quite as forceful on buyers. And it's not all, that's not all builders, but we've seen it. You'll hear the horror stories. You'll hear, you, you better believe when, when builders have uh, done fixed price contracts, but then come back to them later that said, hey, we're actually got to increase your price. Those unrepresented buyers, I assume, just roll with it and say, okay. But the represented buyers by agents in our office get together with Dean, get together with associate brokers like me and say, hey, is this legal? And we actually pull out the language and we say, yes, it's legal, but they have to prove it by showing that the commodity is actually increased. And we go back to that builder and say, hey, we need some proof. And then the builder all of a sudden sings a little different tune and says, hey, instead of increasing the price $45,000, we actually are going to only increase it $30,000 because that's what we can prove. Boom, we just saved our clients fifteen grand. Like Yeah, right now, one of the stats that Gary put up during the vision speech was the percent of real estate transactions represented with buyer agency. Do you guys remember what that stat was? Come on, someone's got to remember it. It was 98%. That is so high. We're, we have more agency now than in past years. Think about that. When the market's this hot, when builders are saying, ah, you don't need a buyer's agent, you don't need this and that, it's still 98% of transactions have an agent. 
that always like reminds me of like, hey, like the value of an agent is absolutely still there, but it's shifting. And that's why we're having conversations like this is what is your value in these scenarios? Stetson. Well, it's, it's competition for sure, right? Because there's even buyer's agents out there right now that say, hey, use me as your buyer's agents and I will rebate you X amount of dollars or whatever. Like we've all seen the gimmicks, right? They're, they're all over the place. That's nothing new, but that also attacks our own value and, and we got to roll with it. And we've got to decide why are you worth a full 3% as a buyer's agent versus we can always pick on homie, right? I don't know, it's a CE class. Maybe we're not supposed to pick on other brokerages if it's official CE discount broker businesses out there um, that will say, hey, we'll kick you back half. You've got to determine, well, why am I worth more than that? What am I going to do to provide more value than the door opener that some of these discount brokerages are? Yeah, do you have a comment? One of the things I, I, I have a friend who does a lot of things, and one of the things that he's done is he's taken the So most agents are great, so, but sometimes they'll get uh, agents that don't have anything. Yeah. He's stuck in everything but it's cut into the shed. And so that's, it's, it's not the norm. He's like, but don't be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Can I touch on that? You guys, I, I know this is a listing class here. We're talking about buyer agency for new construction, but this is important. Um, what Bryson said is really important because I, I am that listing agent, right? Where I have buyer's agents that do absolutely nothing. And then I'm paying them. And on some of my agreements with some of my builders, they're actually getting paid more than I am. And I'm like, ooh, that's painful, that's painful. But I will tell you this, as a buyer's agent representing someone buying new construction, have the phone call with the listing agent that just says, hey, what kind of buyer's agent do you want me to be? Do you want me to be actively involved and in pushing the communication? Or do you want me to take a back seat? How can we best work together? Because I will tell you there's some times where I'm like, you know what, actually just take a back seat. I'll do all the communication because I'm systematized. I'll include you on everything. Just be a great cheerleader, please. It's, there's bumps in the road with new construction. They're gonna go walk through their house and something will be wrong. Remind them that we have final walkthroughs. Remind them that we have inspections and we're gonna address it. Will you be that kind of buyer's agent and just chill out? Because on the flip side, there's some buyer's agents that feel like to create value, they have to be mean to the listing agent and crap on the builder and talk about like, it's almost like, where is this coming from? You're just trying to make a scene for your buyers to create value. Like that's not right either. You got to find that. Remember, once you're under contract, your co-op agent is your partner, not your adversary. You're adversarial during negotiation, sure. But once you have an agreement, you guys are in a partnership to provide value to both sides. You still represent your client. They still represent their client, but you do that in a partnership way. That's really important because yeah, some agents just get, either absentee or they're biting my ankles for no reason. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a YouTube video to share, just like Micah said. Right? Those are the stories where you can create a lot of real value with your clients. Yeah, remember, you're not a realtor in this business. You're everything in this business. You're an escrow officer. You're a lender. You got to do everybody's job because the buck stops with who? You. You are the real estate agent. That's why you're at the top of the totem pole. Lenders buy you lunch. Title people buy you lunch because they understand the buck stops with you. You control the relationship. So you control everything, but it also means when the lender messes up or when the title company makes a, a little blunder, those things are your problem as the agent. You know, I still have a great relationship with the builder because I am her account number. Ah, I mean, love that. And after she came down to the market, but there was a lot of work going on with the environment and everything, and she was just good with her. It's better to be a listing agent though, guys. See this, we could talk all day about buyer agency. Listing agency is a lot, is a lot more exciting. Um, okay, we're gonna go to page 19. Any other comments while we're going through this story? 
Is this helpful? Yes. You get nervous on what 2022 is going to be. Maybe this goes down. This will go up. I'm not nervous. I'm excited for it. Uh, it's interesting business. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot that we can learn from, no, from history. Point out play. It's interesting. And there's always a challenge to every year, to every market, right? Like right now we're just, we're just thinking like, I mean, there's okay. It's great to be a listing agent. It's like gold, right? And very difficult being a buyer's agent. Um, there's, you know, pros and cons, but I mean, when I started in 2014, I mean, yeah, stuff was so cheap. I look at that time and I'm like, man, why was I not just going bonkers in the gold time? But, but no, it was, it had some challenges. Yeah. I, I had an agent complain to me the other day that they showed a family of like 15 homes. They're like, I've been out like three weekends. I've shown 15 homes and they just won't make a decision. And it's one of those like perspective, perspective, perspective. These years right here, like these buyers, 2010, 2011, I kid you not, the average was 50 plus homes that you would show. They'd say, hey, I'm kind of thinking about buying just in this one little Orem neighborhood where right now you might have like the entire city of Vineyard right now has like two listings or whatever it's at. But back then it was like, all right, you want to be in this one like East Orem neighborhood. All right, we have 100 active listings. Um, they're all in your price range. They all meet your criteria. Um, where do we begin? Like it was brutal, right? Like you'd go show so many homes because there were so many options, but the buyers could just pick whatever they want because we were in a buyer's market during that time. Yeah, it's completely different business. My, like being a realtor today literally feels like a whole different business than it was 10 years ago. And I promise you in three years from now, it'll be entirely different. But the name of the business right now in 2022, I promise you is listings, listings, listings. That's why the office is like, we need listing classes. Like buyers are going to come. It's all about listings. The agents, you guys know the ratio for every one listing you have, how many closings should you have total? Like three or four, right? You're going to have that listing for sure, because you have the listing, but then you legit should have two, if not three more additional closings. Why? Buyers. Buyers. The mo one of the most valuable leads, and I figured this out really early on, <coughs> on a lot of these buyers, just from these listings, because I didn't have a, a, I was a college kid, right? My SOI was broke. I was a poor kid from West Valley, so they didn't, weren't buying a lot of houses in the recession. Uh, but those one listings that I had, I found that if, that the most valuable lead source outside of my SOI were sign calls. And I define a sign call as any kind of inquiry about a house, because this is somebody that's shopping, not just browsing or voyeuring is what some people call when they're just poking around on Facebook, looking at properties. They're shopping if they actually reach out. And so to be able to convert those buyers was very easy. It's a little more difficult now, but it's still, in my opinion, the quickest way to a paycheck is a sign call. Hey, I'm happy to show you this house, but if it doesn't work out, can I set you up on my See It First program? It's a program where the minute any home comes on the market that meets your criteria, whether it's a HUD home, a foreclosure, a short sale, an estate sale, a normal listing, a new construction, the minute one of those comes out, you're the first person to know about it and I'll get you in the same day to see it. That way you can be first in line and beat the rush. Does that sound like something that would be valuable to you? Oh, it is great. All I require is two things. Come into the office and sit down with me so I can get crystal clear on your criteria and get pre-approved with my lender so I know you're as good as cash when we go to make offers. Is that fair? Great. I'm going to have my lender call you and do that process. You'll fill out a little app. It's called a fast track. You're going to get a, a, an app request from IntroLend. And then you're going to meet with me. How does tomorrow at four o'clock sound? Great. Boom. Buyer appointment. They're under contract a week later. Right? Like that's the power of my listing. Got me that conversation. That conversation's easy if you guys understand it. Buyers just come. Right? So every listing should be three or four buyers. Okay? Turn to page 19. Are you guys already on page 19? Page 20. Page 20. We're going to breeze through this. Listings leads leverage. Uh, Gary Keller is just going to validate everything we just said. Go, Gary. And lead generation. You are not in the real estate business. You are in the 
And with that comment, we're not talking about lead gen in this class. We're talking about lead conversion. But lead generation is a whole class in and of itself. But it is funny. You'll notice this class, we are not talking about lead generation for listings. But that is the name of the game because without leads, there's no point to even have all this conversation. So do the fundamentals, do your 10-4, call your SOI, and that's all we're going to say about lead generation. Let's talk about lead converting. When you get these leads that come in, they come in in a few different ways. If you guys turn to page 22, leads come at different motivation levels. Jake Bowers, is there, any, is there such thing as a good lead and a bad lead? Why not? In the cycle. So everybody is, a, everybody is a buyer, everybody is a seller. They're just at different scale. They're just at a different spot on the motivation scale, right? So somebody that just bought a house yesterday, are they a seller? Are they a lead? Yes, but they're right here. When are they going to sell that house? Statistically, five to seven years, they're going to sell that house. So you've got an opportunity. We say year zero and year five to seven statistically. Ooh, drop better than Jordan. That's why Jordan's here. Oh, there you go. There's your cycles. This is the day somebody buys or sells a house. This is the next day. Most of your leads are going to end up somewhere on that. Wait, what's this dot? This is the day they buy or sell. This is the next day. Oh, the next day. That's the fine. day after you closed on your home, Clay, how likely were you to go purchase another home? You were probably the farthest you will ever be from buying your next house. Mm -hmm. I like it. This is where that on average is so seven years. My line is that line. Yes. There we go. But remember, it's cyclical because they're not going to just do it once. Totally. They do it over and over and over again. You to follow that pattern. Thank you. No, that's awesome. But that's my whole point is I, one of the things that drives me nuts is when somebody says, oh, I got this lead, but it's a bad lead. No, it's not a bad lead. It's an unmotivated lead because they're somewhere, they're somewhere here at the beginning, right? And so you just have to understand where they're at in that process. So if you look at page 22, now we're getting into systems, you guys. You need a system to categorize your leads. You have A leads, B leads, C leads, right? We're just chunking down. Where are they at in the motivation scale and how are you going to track that? So we have different kinds of buckets and there's a lot of different ways that people do this, but ultimately, and if we go to, I think we skipped it, but remember the concept right here, this is the Gary Keller concept that we're talking about. There's two ways that people build their businesses, right? One way is they just have all these cool creative ideas, this little random gimmick that they're going to do or whatever. And then they're just going to sprinkle the models on top. Well, that's an unstable business because it's not consistent. The ideal is to build a business built on models and then sprinkle your creativity on top. So the model here that we're talking about, this is a good illustration, is having a systematized way to categorize your leads. Now, the creativity might be how many categories you do and what kind of touch campaign you administer to each of those categories. Does that make sense? So you've got your hot, you've got your, well, this is what I call them. Um, I've written in my book here, but A leads, I call them hot leads, right? And hot usually means they're going to list and sell when? Yeah, they're like now. They're like under 30 days. They are ready to go. I need to be meeting with them. A B lead, I call a nurture, is, is, is what bucket? I think it even says on here, you guys. You can totally cheat. <laughs> says right there, two months, right? Up to two months. And then finally, your C leads are more than the two months, right? And I call those the watch. Now, the reason we call them hot, nurture, and watch, hot is hot. We all get that. Nurture means that I need to be fairly proactive in, in, in the communication. Watch means that I can be a little bit reactive and, and, and tone down my communication because they've got a little time, but I'm still absolutely touching. If you turn the page to the funnel, look at page 23. This is outdated, but I want you guys to think of command. Command breaks down this funnel, right, with your opportunities. And you can drag your opportunities, you can drag your deals into the different parts of the funnel, and you can do different campaigns on it. Is it on here, actually? It is, right? So you get your, you get your, you get your leads that come in, you immediately categorize them, and you, then you decide, 
uh, which, ad, which campaign you're going to do with the objection, with the objective, excuse me, of actually connecting with them to cold debate them. So leads come in, you connect with them, and then you determine, are they hot? Are they a watch? Like, who are they? What are they doing? And then you decide what campaign you're going to cultivate to get to the appointment. Uh, how many campaigns, well, first let me ask, is anybody, does it, is, are you guys doing this? Do you guys have this in command? You know what I'm talking about? You're doing it? So how many different campaigns might you have with your leads? What's that? There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. You got an example you're going to pull up for them? You can turn on that one. By the way, the reason I turn off this screen and the reason I stand over here is I am blind in this eye. So I can see all of you guys. I can't see you, but that's also why I like picking on you because it forces me to actually turn and see. Otherwise, if I talk to just you guys, you guys are like dead to me. So uh, that's why I turned that off is I thought I'll stand here and then I can actually see out here. So um, be cautious when uh, somebody at the office says, hey, do you want to come play soccer? We'll let you be our goalie. And uh, you say, yeah, that sounds fun. I've never played soccer in my life. I'll be the goalie. And then you go with a bunch of old dudes that think they're freaking Beckham and they decide to get a little crazy and kick you in the face and put you in the hospital for two weeks and make you blind in one eye. You'll think twice next time you say, yeah, I'll go play soccer with the Keller Williams team. Ah, oh, but we have a good attitude. My cup is half full, you guys. I still got, that's why we got two eyes, right? You can lose one. So you've, I've got a spare. Um, yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. And believe it or not, I even had a doctor I was snowboarding with and he was sitting with me and he said, you know, statistically, when people lose one eye, statistically, they have a high probability of losing the other eye because they're clumsy. I'm like, thanks, jerk. Like, <laughs> I'm going to push you off the ski lift. He really said that to me. I'm like, that really makes me feel good. Doctors. Oh, freaking doctors. Uh, all right, let's keep going, guys. Funnel lead conversion. I want to get to... Um, if you guys go through this, let's just actually skip, let's just kind of skim this real quick. If you guys turn the page to 24, uh, Gary says, well, let's pick on you, Gary, Bryce on page 24. This is an important point for why you need to cultivate your leads because you want to get there first. What does he say? Getting to the table first or second. Yes, you guys underscore that. Gary had the stat on the slide again last week that most people actually only, it, somebody helped me out. It was like 80%, 80% of listings only interview one agent. Was that, it was 80 something. It was high. It was high. So when I use a scenario like, yeah, you're going to compete with four other agents. That's actually pretty rare. It's all about getting there first, because if you're, if you're scripted, if you're good, if you've got a great consultation, great presentation, you can lock them down. They won't interview the other agents. They found you, they like you, they sign. Get there first, that's powerful. Um, so skim over 25, this goes over the capture process. Uh, page 26 has some different examples. Look down at the second half of page 26. It has the 10 days of pain. Uh, other people call this the 10 days of gain or the 14 days of love whatever. I do a 14 day campaign where when I get a new lead, I make sure that they receive some sort of communication with me every single day for two weeks until they respond. And we can have that initial conversation where I can get to the pre-approval script, which we're coming up to here in just a second. Page 27, we connect with them. And so let me ask you this. What is the goal of that first initial conversation? What's your goal? You guys can cheat in that first paragraph. What's our goal when we connect with potential seller leads? And let's even do a scenario. My mom calls me, right? She's my, my number one SOI person. She says, Clay, guess what? After 15 years of you asking me to refer you business, I finally have my neighbor that is thinking about selling her house. Here's her phone number. Call her. I call her. What's my objective? What do I want to do when I call her? Someone raised their hand. I lost it. Blindside. Right, so you immediately want to establish some confidence that you are the LeBron James of selling real estate or whatever you want to call it, right? You're, you're, you're good at what you're doing. You're calling with a purpose. What else? Bingo. First of all, that is our number one goal is I want to get inside that house. I want to see the house. I want to get face-to-face -face with the person. I want to set the appointment. What else? Yeah. Provide value right in the very, very first conversation. Great. How might you might do that in the first conversation? Um, 
Yep, right out the gates, asking good diagnosing questions, which the number one thing you wanna find out on that phone call is what is their motivation? If you set an appointment and you don't know why they're selling, whoops, what in the heck are you? <laughs> Your whole listing appointment is going to be geared around their motivation. There's a big difference between somebody that says, I am so excited. I got the sweetest job in Palo Alto. I'm going to go work at Facebook. It's my dream job. I got to be there in 60 days. So I got to sell my house compared to somebody that says, uh, you're coming over here because I hate my husband. We're getting divorced and we need to figure out how to dump this house. It's a different energy. It's a different conversation. And there could be a completely different timetable. And there could be other components that the divorce attorneys need to be involved. What's going to be declared in the decree? Is one spouse going to buy out the other spouse? That's different than, holy smokes, we've got 60 days. Is your family moving with you to Palo Alto or is somebody going to stay behind? Let's talk about in this market, is it better that you're actually in the house so I have a staged house? Or are you filthy dirty? And would I rather just get you to Palo Alto and get you out of here so I have a vacant clean house that I can sell, right? I've got to figure out those things. There are different scenarios that we're creating. So I want to connect with the person. Um, avoid the pitfalls. Not asking questions to get to know the seller to become overly confident that you can lose the lead. Uh, page 28. This is awesome. Keller Williams loves the language of sales and the language of sales is generally tied directly to personality assessments. If you guys have ever heard of DISC, who's heard of DISC or hasn't heard of DISC, I guess. DISC is a very, very common one that Tony, Tony Robbins has promoted. We say, is this person a D, I, S, or C? That's kind of the same thing. Are they a D? Are they an assertive bottom line type of person? Or are they an I, the sociable person? Uh, are they a C, a structured person? That's your accountants, that's your, you know, your, your perfectionists. Uh, or are they an S, are they a steady, safe, cautious, moving person? Who am I talking to? I want to know that, right? Because my listing presentation and my conversations with a D, that assertive bottom line person, is far different than a C, which is a details, everything needs to be perfect person, right? So what question might I ask to kind of find out what kind of person am I talking to. During that first call, I'm calling my mom's neighbor and I'm saying, hey, what's your motivation? Why are you selling? She says, oh, I'm just retiring and I'm downsizing. I'm in the house I raised my family in. It's way too big. I just need to downsize. And so that's why I'm selling. Great. I want to know what kind of personality is, it, does she have? I'm going to ask one of my favorite pre-qualifying questions, which is, hey, Adrian, will you describe your house for me? So they describe it and they say, uh, actually, my house is three bedrooms. It's two baths um, and uh, it's on a half acre lot. And I probably think I could sell it for 525. What kind of person am I talking to? I'm that, D I I'm that bottom line person, right? If I talk to somebody and I say, hey, describe your house for me. She says, oh my gosh, I am the party house in the neighborhood. I have like the cutest, most adorable pergola. I have like this big theater that's super awesome. And they're describing their house in social ways. I know I've got that social person, right? So there's, that's one question can kind of help you decide how am I going to change my language of sales and what am I going to speak to? Does that make sense? You guys like it? We're going fast. There's some scripts and role plays on 29, 30, and 31, that's what I want to get to. 31 is the page I want you guys to star and highlight, print it, copy it, put it on your wall. So when we have that first initial conversation from a lead, we talk about pre-qualifying sellers. Now, in this context, I'm not talking about pre-qualified for a mortgage. We talk about qualifying your leads. And this is either for buyers or sellers. But qualifying your leads means that you're getting the whole snapshot of what they're all about and how you might be able to provide value. So this course has right here a pre-listing lead sheet. It's essentially a cheat sheet to say, hey, you know what? You should probably get all of these questions answered before you ever meet with these people, right? So number one, I want to know how did you hear about me? So why do I want to know that? Thank the referral. I want to reward the referral. If it's a referral from my SOI, you better believe that before I even meet with these people, they're getting a thank you card, a gift card. I'm going to celebrate and reward the behavior of giving me the referral. Regardless, I might call this person and they might say, uh, your mom was crazy. I am not selling my house. I don't know where she got that idea that I was going to sell my house, uh, but thanks for calling anyway. 
I'm still sending a gift card to that referral to reward the activity of thinking about me and sending me a referral. How much do you spend here in I do hundreds of dollars a month. Is that what you're asking? In, re, in gifts? What, what, about what, legally, what legally can you do, you guys? 150. 150, right? Now, I don't always take it to 150. I'm usually doing random little gift cards, Cafe Rio, Ruth's Chris. I'm usually around 50 bucks. I've done bigger. I've done bigger. I've also done two. One when they give me the lead, then when it closes, I'm sending you know, a gift basket or something, not only to the people that close, but back to that referral source to say, holy smokes, you're exactly why I love my business. I'm in a word of mouth business and that's the business I like being in. Thank you. You're a huge part of my life and I want to celebrate that, right? Yeah, I spend hundreds of dollars a month in gifts, lunches, gift cards, and I try to get creative when you get busy, it's always hard, right? So sometimes, yeah, I'm the guy that just sends a Cafe Rio gift card. But if I can get purposeful, I'm like, oh, I know he loves the jazz. I wanna try to send some jazz swag or something uh, to that person, does that make sense? So number two, where are you moving? Which is uh, just another question to say, why, why, why? I wanna know your motivation. And I wanna make that motive, I wanna get really clear on that motivation. Uh, um, because I'm going to have to rely on that when it comes time to make hard decisions. You guys understand what I'm saying there? When there's hard decisions to be made, like, hey, the cat litter stinks. It's very easy to tie that back to, you've got to make this move. You need to be in Palo Alto in 60 days. We don't have time to turn anybody off. We need everybody to love your home, including those that don't like cats. So let's neutralize that situation and let's get that cat litter box out of here and let's send the cat to the farm or to a parent's house or a friend's house, but let's get that animal out of here. So we have the best chances of getting multiple offers and being attractive to all buyers. That's just an example. I always like picking on pets, right? Okay, how soon do you have to be there? I wanna know timeline. If you sell your home in the next 30 days, will that pose any problems for you, right? I wanna get really clear because in this market, I could darn well sell your home in 30 days. Is that gonna jam you up? What would happen if you don't sell your home? I wanna know that. Is that even an option? Is it an option to keep the home, right? And then of course, I wanna know how much you owe on the property. Why? Why do I wanna know that? Why am I asking that right on the first phone call? It's a little invasive, right? Isn't that personal? Yeah. Right. I want to know what they're, I know what they're, I want to be able to create that net sheet even before I go into the house to get a, a sense of what their equity position. I also want to know if they're a short sell. You guys, they'll come back someday. But you always ask that because when somebody says, oh yeah, I just did a refi. I bought this big boat. I just pulled every penny of cash out of my house. And then there's a little, and in, in, in this market, it might not be a, the entire market, but maybe that neighborhood has a little, uh, a lawsuit hits the HOA. And now all of a sudden they have a pending assessment uh, that just lowered all of their value. These are true stories, by the way, that the whole HOA is in a fiasco of a lawsuit. So values actually do go down in that neighborhood. And now I'm saying, uh-oh, these people could be in a pinch. I need to prepare for that so I can have that as part of the com conversation, right? So I wanna know that. Um, I'll be sending you a packet of information. They're missing one question. Everyone plot your pens. They're missing the most important question for, this is the question I always wanna know. And that is, you're not wearing a name tag and I wanna pick on you, but you're not wearing a name tag. What's your name? Angie. 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 How much do you owe on your, or excuse me, what do you think your home is worth? Is it on there? Did I miss it? Number seven, I skipped it. How much do you want to list your home for? Yeah, I was going to say, you got me. Yeah. What do you want to sell your home for? Or what do you think your home is worth? I want to know that. I want to know that. Why? Yeah, I want to know where I want to know. Yeah, exactly. I want to, it's all about expectations. This is the expectation question. What? Yes, I want to know, am I walking into a scenario where I will be the hero or am I walking in where I am going to be the bad guy? Those are two different listing presentations because of expectations. And here's the thing, Zillow can absolutely be accurate, but Zillow can absolutely be wrong too. <laughs> and so I did a listing presentation just on Tuesday. Of course, I will not go on a listing without looking at Zillow. Why? Is it because Zillow is the authority on CMA? 
No, because I know my clients have looked at Zillow. And even though I asked this question, I know they still have looked at it. I usually check realtor.com and Redfin as well. Just, I just Google their address and whatever the top three sites are, I'm gonna click on them because you know your clients did that as well. And so when I ask that question and they say, hey, I think my home is worth 700. This is my appointment on Tuesday. So I'm really hoping I'm like 700. I look at the comps. All the comps are low 600s. There's one, one neighbor with the pool and way more square footage and all of that. They got 705. I pull up Zillow. Zillow's even saying 690. And I'm like, crap, freaking Zillow, freaking weird comp that has way more than this listing has. You've ruined my expectations for my seller because now she wants 700. But all of my comps are saying, even with the multiple offers, everything are low 600s. So now I know what I'm walking into. I walk into the house, I'm thinking, okay, does she have a pool? Is it like super nice? No, unfortunately, the house is hammered. The carpet's got bubbles in it. There's dings in the walls. There's a leak in the roof. And now I get to say, okay, we need to have a, a conversation. And that's not an easy conversation because it's going to be a conversation of, we need to set your expectations that you're likely not going to get 700,000 for your house. We're going to go over that in about an hour. We're going to do the listing presentation as a class and we're just going to roll through it. Uh, but the quick answer is you do it truthfully and wide open and don't be ashamed. You can be diplomatic. I'm not going to say, well, your house sucks. Your house this. But when you're going through the CMA, let's just talk about it right now. When you're going through the CMA, you let the CMA do the talking. So you use language when you're laying out those comparables and you say, look, not only do I look at recent sales, you know, like an appraiser, I also want to look at under contracts and actives because those are likely going to be our, our best comps, right? Especially the under contracts. So let's just compare. This house is on this size of lot. It's got these features and you can look at some of the photos here. It's in this condition. How do you think you stack up to this house? And then I let them say, oh, that is bigger. It's got a pool. It's nicer. Okay, so a buyer is going to think the same way as that, right? This is how we determine value as we look at comparables and a buyer does the same thing. And so we know we're not going to be as valuable as this home. How much, how much of a swing? We don't know it quite that much, but let's see what the other comps tell us. How does this comp look? This looks exactly like my house. Great, this is a good comp, right? Yeah. So I tend to be very direct and, and very feel abrasive you guys like that daniel said on a scale from one to ten daniel how honest can i be with you that's my favorite line i ask a lot of people that at the listing appointment right at the gates when i'm standing in their door and say okay hey, i'm going to set the expectations i'm here to walk through your house and take some notes because i want to see which comparables are going to be best and then i'll put a game plan together and let's talk through pricing let's look at the comps to come through pricing and while we go through that process on a scale from one to 10, how honest can I be with you? People will chuckle and they say, well, I wanna be a 10. I say, okay, then you don't get offended because I'm here to diagnose a situation and I'm gonna shoot it to you straight, fair enough. I'll even shake people's hands sometimes, like kind of make fun of it. But then that totally allows me to say, guys, this is a beautiful home, but I smell something. And you told me to be honest. It doesn't stink, but I do smell something. Do you have a pet? It doesn't stink. I'm not saying your home stinks, but I do smell something. I'd probably recommend we neutralize that. Like, let's figure that out. Let's grab some, let's grab some uh, Pura. You know, let's get a Pura going. Let's, I, I've got some, if you need to borrow mine, let's get some smell going. Um, you know, you can have those harder conversations with that. Somebody else raised their hand. Yeah, yes. I use it, kind of say the same thing. I tell them part of my job is to be very honest. Yeah. So Would you want a doctor to sugarcoat news to you? Like, heck no. Ooh, I like that. Give them permission to. Yes. Great point. Yeah. Totally. And I usually remind people too, hey, as we go through this walkthrough, don't feel like you have to hide anything from me because you think I'm going to tell our buyers. I do represent you and your interests. So if you like feel really worried that there's something here that's going to negatively impact the sale, tell me, I'll help you hide it with you. Just kidding. <laughs> but really, we're going to neutralize it, right? Like, let's solve it. Let's solve it. Yeah. Um, I, something I found is that we approach it from more of a strategy standpoint. Like, okay, like our goal is to get the most out of this house. Like, what's the highest? If you overprice it, 
like the fire station, so that the same car can come to the same conclusion that I came to, that this is what it's being worth, they're not going to put it up under this thing. Then what happens? Then you have to adjust your price down. And now so if the buyer's mind is going, I can't tell this is worth it. Right. And so that's what I wanted to avoid, is I want to get it as high as legally possible. Yeah, did you guys hear what he said? Because that is important. We're skipping way ahead, like when we're having the pricing conversation, but I think that's good. And that's letting people know the negative impacts of overpricing your home and having to come down in price. It is absolutely, especially in the market when you're in, you can't list a home too low. You can't. You can list a home for $1 on the MLS. You will have an auction. Like if you are too low, this market saves your freaking bacon as listing agents. I've even told people that. I don't care what you list it for. It can be anything under this amount. And I'm going to freaking be a rock star and get you multiple offers and all that stuff. And you're going to love me and you're going to love this market because we're going to have a bidding war and it's going to raise it up. But where agents can make the mistake is overpricing homes. You shoot yourself, in the, even in this market where it's like, well, you can't really make a mistake as everything sells. No, you get overpriced in this market and then all of a sudden it sits for more than three weeks, even more than like two weeks right now, depending on our price point. But if you're in like our median sales price, you got a home at 520 and you sit on the market for more than three weeks, even the newest of buyer's agents or even any public is gonna look at that days on market, which every website now shows days of market, which days on market is the thermostat for urgency. And the minute you hit that three week mark, everybody, is gonna think, what is wrong with that house? And this is how I talk to my seller. If we overprice it and we don't get that off in the first three weeks, we are in trouble because now we're, I don't wanna call it a stigmatized house, but we definitely have a black eye, right? We do not want that days on market. When I first started teaching this class, by the way, before this market, it was three months. Now I'm saying three weeks, isn't that funny? Literally, I'd say if your house is on the market longer than three months, like you have a problem, but selling a home in 90 days was the, the norm. If you guys look back, this is just like three years, like right before COVID, our average days on market was like 49 days or whatever. Last week when MLS sent it out, it was what? 12 days. Whew. It's amazing. 12 days. Uh, Gary Keller on page 32 says the right approach to close for the meeting is the only approach. Ask for it. That goes back to this whole conversation of set the appointment, right? You want to get in that door. All right. Pages 34 and 35 have some great soft and hard closes for you guys to go through. Again, this isn't a scripts class, but it's in here. So next time you guys are like doing a power up or you're in opportunity zone with Carl and you guys say, hey, let's practice closing people, you know, some, some good closing lines or some good language of sales. Right, pull this out, go through some of these and practice some closes. The easiest close for me is really just to ask for it. So I'm talking to my mom's neighbor, whatever, and she says, yeah, I'm thinking about selling. It simply is, hey, the next step to get you where you wanna be is can I come look at your house? I wanna do a price analysis on your house and I'm not the realtor that's just gonna try to do it without seeing your house. I really wanna come see it. I wanna meet you. Let's figure out what the best plan is for you. So is it better for you to meet on a weekday or a weekend and morning or evenings work best for you? Let's just set that appointment, right? Nothing too, too crazy there. So we set the appointment. We're skipping 36, 37. We're not going to role play this because we're going through time. Um, page 39 is, is just going to acknowledge that you might have to cultivate. I might say, hey, mom's neighbor, uh, when do you want to sell? And she says, actually, I don't want to do anything until summer. Okay, why? Let's find that motivation. Let's figure out what your plan is. Well, I'm not moving because I actually still have a son in school. He graduates high school here. Uh, I want to make sure that he finishes and gets off to college. Now I'm truly the empty nester. And that's when I say, okay, great, that makes sense. But there's still some steps. Now, if somebody tells me, hey, I'm out till summer, when do I set the appointment? I still want to set the appointment for as soon as possible. That's my personal approach. I would still rather get in there. I would, I would be happy if I have to do two, if not three listing appointments, if I can still secure that listing. So instead of saying, all right, well, since it's summer, I'll call you in May or I'll call you on June, I'm gonna say this, and that is, hey, that's wonderful, but how about we do this? One of the, value that I, one of the values that I provide is simply diagnosing if there's any repairs or updates we should do the home to create even more value. I'm sure you've heard of house flipping. Have you ever heard of that term, people that flip houses? Well, you actually have the opportunity to do the same thing. There might be some elements to your house that if we update, we will get not only the cost of what that update costs, but actually profit 
from that, just like the house flippers you see on HGTV. So how about I come over to your house today and let's identify if you do have any, you might not, but let's see if there are any elements to your home that we actually might wanna put a little investment into to get a bigger bang for our buck this summer. Sound good? Great, let's meet. So what did I do there? I created more value in, wow, I'm really glad I'm talking like a great agent, right? They're not just here to sell my house, but they're here to do what? Put more money in my pocket. The mission statement for my personal business is on my wall in my office, and it's to help my clients and friends develop legacy wealth through real estate. And I tell people that on a constant basis. My number one goal for you, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is really to net you the most amount of money. And that's not through cheap commission or what, whatnot. It's through great real estate strategies to milk every penny out of that house, right? So that's going to start with the consultation of deciding, do we have repairs to do on the house? Make sense? So I'm going to get in that really fast, but I still got to cultivate. So now I've got to go plan. I've got four months. If somebody says, hey, call me back in three months, I'm going to call them when? This is what you were saying. I'm going to half whatever they tell me, and that's when I'm going to call. If they say, hey, call me in two weeks, I'm calling in one week. If they say, hey, I'm six months out, they're really only three months out. People usually tend to over-exaggerate their timetable, uh, and it's just not the case, right? Okay, go to page 41 and grab your pen. Actually, don't grab your pen. I want you to raise your hand. Ahas. We're done with the first section of lead conversion. Did anyone learn anything? Did you learn anything in this conversation? We just spent 45 minutes, right? Awesome. Yeah, well, especially buyers right now, when someone says, hey, will you open this door? Yeah, after you meet with me at the office and we get clarity on your plan. Otherwise, you are just another uh, functionary door opener. Stetson, what'd you learn? Yeah, to say that another, I guess I'll, can I add just two things? The first is, is I attribute a lot of the reason why those builders eventually rolled with me was because I had done so many existing sale listings and I've developed a good enough marketing plan and, and really specific tactics, like what I put in the agent remarks on my listings, how I speak to create multiple offers. And then for me to demonstrate that to, hey, builder, you haven't had this because you've had model home agents. And model home agents do not think like normal listing agents. They sit there and they're very reactive and not very proactive. And so for me to demonstrate some of the strategies that I do on my existing listings, help me land those builders. The second thing I was gonna say is this, and that is <clears throat> when we talk about being focused on, on uh, uh, listings, I think your marketing dollars should as well. If you are paying for buyer leads, I think that's a mistake. And this is Clay talking. This isn't the book or whatever. I would challenge you guys that every penny you spend for marketing should be geared towards sellers. Why? Because buyers will come. They just naturally will come with listings. Right now, Red Sign Team, we pay barely anything. We do have some Google ads going on. We do have some Facebook campaigns that are buyer, but it's like not even $100. Almost all of our marketing dollar is promoting our listings or promoting things that will cause uh, more listings to come in, like free CMA, just the classic old, you know, seven, seven, seven steps to improve your home's value before you go to sell. Uh, Micah's ideas of videos, like that's where you put your marketing dollars is toward listings. It kills me when I hear people that say, oh yeah, all of our marketing dollars, we just buy Zillow leads. Okay, there's people that built great businesses, but it's all buyers and you're not building a listing business. It's wild, so that's the other comment. Sorry, any other ahas? What else, what'd you learn? What'd you guys learn? Let's get one more. One more, Graydon. Well, yeah, I was thinking about, I like, I like the model where if someone just buys a house, they're not very likely to buy another one, but they're still on the spectrum, right? So I was thinking, well, they just, maybe they just sold their house and they 
bought a house. They've got $220,000 that enabled them to buy their new house, and they've got some money left over. Well, is this person not a lead if they just bought a house? Well, let's talk about investing. Totally. Got some more money. And, you know, at that time, they buy a new house. It might be a good opportunity to talk about real estate investing. So they're still a client. They still could purchase. Absolutely. And when you talk to these people like, oh, I just bought my house. Great opportunity to say, well, when you went through that process, did you talk to anybody else that got jealous of you getting a new house? Is that somebody I should talk to? I'd love to earn, your bu I'd love to earn their business as well. Right? You ask for referrals. All right. Grab your pens. This is important for this class. On the bottom of page 41, I want you to create an action item. What's the one thing that we covered so far today uh, that you can do right now regarding lead conversion? What's the one thing you can do? It'll make everything else easier that we talked about. It might be, I'm going to jump into command and I'm going to categorize, you know, get a better system for categorizing my leads. It might be, I'm going to print off that pre-qualifying question list. I'm going to staple it to my wall and I'm going to memorize them so I can start doing this. It might be whatever. Just write down an action item so that you're not just a vacationer in this room. Write an action item. What's it going to be? What's something you can take away from that conversation? Okay, you got it. Stan, what are you doing? I am going to get more listing opportunities. Awesome. How are you going to do it? I'm going to, when I hear, which I, I do hear stuff, and sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other, I'm just going to be better about it. It's like, wait, this is, a, this is a listing opportunity. It might, yeah, maybe they're not as serious right now, but maybe I just need to put more effort into that than to the, these other four buyers that are all trying to buy the same thing. It's not really happening. Awesome. It's just where are we going to put our time and effort? Awesome. And it starts with mindset. That's why I like this class. You got to shift that mindset. Okay, everyone stand up. Stand up. I want you to give five high fives. Five high fives. Hey, right here, right here, right here. Oh, yeah. All right. All right, sit down, sit down, sit down. We're going fast. Guys, we got to plow. Lunch will be here in one hour, but we're going to go fast. Turn the page to 44, 44, 44, 44. Your pre listing. So we're still going through this role play, right? We just set an appointment. Woohoo, we ring the bell. We're going to go meet with the neighbor. Uh, we got her all pre qualified with those questions. We're excited about it. Now, what do we do, right? So turn to page 45. It's called a pre-listing, a pre-listing packet, a pre-listing process, but it's the pre-listing. It's the what do you do after you set the appointment, but before you go on that appointment, right? So you read right on the top of 45. It's a package. It's a process. It's a buy-in. The pre-listing package greatly increases the odds of a successful appointment with a working relationship. The goal of a pre-listing packet is what? What do we want to do with a listing packet? Why are, we, why are we considering a listing packet? What's our goal with it? You guys can cheat. Look down. Right? We want to do some pre-selling. Micah says, be the expert. Experts do this. Professional people will have some sort of, of preparatory item, right? So we want to do some pre-selling, and we want to save time. How might a, a listing packet or information before the appointment save you time? It might even answer those questions, right? It's going to tell them and set the stage uh, on what to do. Right. If you have a powerful listing package, its main job is to cover the dirty work, all the things that people might object to and all the things that people need to know about. So if you turn the page to page 46, let's let's have a discussion right here. What do you want in that pre listing packet? What do you want in here? And let me actually let me just back up. The pre listing packet has had an, an, an evolution uh, 15 years ago. Uh, this was very much. Uh, a printed packet, you would take it, you would hand deliver it, uh, you know, or have somebody go deliver it to the house and they'd have it. 
It's modified or not. A lot of people nowadays simply do an email with a video presentation of their listing that says, you know, hey, thanks for setting the appointment with me. I'm excited to meet with you. Uh, in preparation for our meeting, I want to get the following information to you to prep for that and come in a lot of ways. There was a time where we had a few agents that got really clever and they were having a printed packet like this uh, that would have Uber drivers go and deliver to the house because they could send it over like within an hour of having that phone call. They would immediately send a driver just to wow people like, holy smokes, a packet's on my doorstep. Like I just talked to him an hour ago, you know, it was very impressive. So there's a lot of different ways to deliver this. So let's dive into what is this? So sorry, great, and go ahead. What do you want in this pre-listing packet? Let's rattle them off and let's write them down. What do you want to have in this packet? Yeah, let's talk about it. I've heard uh, regarding the net sheet, maybe some people really like it in there. Some people definitely no, don't include that. So what, uh, how do you feel? Well, right to the controversial one. Listen. Right to the controversial one. Uh, back it up. Do you have, because you can't have a net sheet without comps, right? So do you, do, do you have comps and pricing and a net sheet in the pre-listing packet? Yes or no? Who says no? Raise your hand. Who says yes? Raise your hand. We've got a couple of yeses. Who says I have no idea? All right, no's. Why do you not want it in there? Right. Right. Yeah, there's some caution there that you don't want to be selected just based on, well, which realtor thinks my home is worth the most? Ooh, she thinks my home is worth the most. I'm going with her. Right. And some sellers totally act that way and you need to combat that and educate it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, it might not be accurate. I want to hear from the yes. Now you don't dare to. <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm raise my hand. You shouldn't raise your hand. Are there any other yeses? Is there an argument to include it? Well, what about this strategy? Email. Uh, you could email a spreadsheet and not include the price. You're not. You're That's what I was going to say too. You're declaring the fees and kind of what they could stand to make, make uh, take away at the end of the day. But they can adjust that price and they know. You right. The price that, that was going to be my argument for the yes is I do like including the potential cost of selling. I have an FAQ in my packet that simply says, do you discount your commission? No. It's 3% for me. And I recommend that you offer 3% to a buyer's agent. That is word for word what my listing packet says in the FAQ. Right. But I still have. Yeah. We have those fees. The other thing I was going to say on it, on having your price included is that's kind of like the ultimate carrot to the whole conversation. So if you give that right out at the very beginning, everything else you say is kind of muted a little bit because they already got what they wanted from you, which is the price. So even in my presentation consultation, I have all the other conversation first and I save price for last. Right? It's the last thing I want to talk about. So if you send the price beforehand, that is your price, the agent, and not their price. You guys understand that. I think one of the blunders is the agents think that pricing a home is their job. It's not. Pricing the home is the seller's job. Your job is to educate the seller in a way that they choose a correct pricing strategy to yield the most amount of money possible for their home. Yeah. Interesting. And I want to save all of that for when I'm with them. Even if they're out of state and I'm on a Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say you're risky giving them a price because you can't have that consultation. And again, it's you giving them the price, not helping them discover for themselves what the price would be. The last thing in the world I want is, a, is a, for it to be my price. 
even the people that say, hey, Clay, I just need to hurry and sell this investment property. You pick the price, just sell it. I trust you entirely. That's really cool. I appreciate that trust. And I will do all of that. But the one thing I want to have a conversation is on price. So you fully understand our pricing strategy and so that it's your strategy. And I'll tell you why I'm recommending this strategy, but I want them to decide this is what I'm doing. Yeah. So to her point, you know, just an observation I've made uh, in this market is a lot of the homeless people are screaming. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. So I sold one of my rentals to Open Door, full disclosure, uh, and I took advantage of them. They paid me forty something thousand dollars more than the appraisal. I had it under contract. Uh, the appraisal came in forty something thousand dollars under value. I lost that buyer. I thought, shoot, I'm gonna have to at least reduce it a little bit or whatever. Same day, Open Door said we'll buy it, and it was even higher than my other offer. And they didn't know. I said, okay, you can have it. That was last May. And to this day, that home is still owned by Open Door, not even listed. It's overgrown and it's a dump now. It's really sad. They were just well, last year we all knew the writing, right? Like I read in men, I know it. they were very aggressive, right? And so they were just buying everything up and I took advantage of it and they bought the home. I don't think they ever had it inspected. They asked me to do a video tour. So I did my video tour, but did I talk much? No, it's not my responsibility. And they bought it. They bought it sight unseen. I'm pretty sure nobody ever stood, stepped foot in that house. They just took my video and analyzed that, made me an offer. Risky business. I think that's why iBuyer is licking their wounds a little bit right now. And Open Door is not the only one. There's a handful of them. So, guys, back on topic. Back on topic. What are we putting in this packet? What are we putting in this packet? Rattle them off. What do you want in there? Have some market stats, right? Some neighborhood niche stats. I want the marketing plan in there, right? I'm going to say, hey, this is what I do to sell houses. What else? Yeah, for sure. Here's my value proposition. This is why I'm a great agent. This is my system. This is, my, this is what I do. This is my marketing plan. What else? Yeah, for sure. You might not do the whole CMA, but you can still have some market data that says, hey, here's kind of our, the average days on market stuff. Like, for, for oh, us. for you. Ah, yeah. I love some of those stats when, uh, when we were at, uh, oh, some KW thing, but it was our brokerage where we showed that our brokerage is actually out trending, uh, outpacing some of the normal market stats in terms of days on market and sold price to list price. Those are always kind of cool. You know, I sell, I, my average sales price is actually 103% to my list price. That shows that I know how to work the multiple offer game and work the magic. Yeah, another hand. Testimonials. That's what I was really fishing for too. We're in 2022. Everything lives and dies with five-star reviews on everything. When was the last time you bought something that you were unfamiliar with without reading some reviews? It just doesn't happen, right? We always take a peek at reviews. So get some reviews. If you're a new agent, how do you get reviews? You're brand new. You've never, who's never sold a house? I didn't even ask that to me. Who's never listed a house? It's okay, own it. Even Brother Bowers, who's been in the business two years and outsold half this room, has been all 100% buyers. Welcome, welcome. Right? right? <laughs> So you haven't sold a home before, and so it's, uh, you might not have a testimonial. So how do you get one? Besides just asking your mom, hey, mom, write me a five-star review about being a good son. My yeah, so there's a couple of things. You can do character referrals on LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn, I have a whole bunch of like people that are just my friends that like wrote me a review. We don't really do LinkedIn a whole lot nowadays anymore, but they're character reviews, but you can also use office reviews. There's nothing wrong with providing some reviews that say, hey, my team, my office, KW, we're all a team, we're all a family here. We've got three awesome reviews right here because there are reviews right now on Google for our office that don't have the agent's name. It just says Westfield took great care of me. KW was awesome to work with. I highly recommend them. Sweet. Screenshot in my packet sent, right? So don't feel alone. You are on a team. You're, you're, you're at the brokerage that more residential transactions flowed through these than any other brokerage in Utah County. 
Own that. Be proud of that. You're part of that team now. So you can share that for sure. Okay, so what else? What are we missing on here? What page has actually the list? I just started jabbered away. So you want your value proposition on 48. Uh, you want maybe some homework assignments. So you might have a list in there. Hey, here's some tips on staging or prepping the home. Uh, you've got uh, something special, like you deliver it with a box of crumble cookies for them to go through. One of the dorkiest things I ever did back in like 2008, I was brand new. It was like a year into the business. I showed up with my packet on the doorstep me and i learned real quick i will never deliver a listing packet again because i showed up on the doorstep ring the doorbell and they opened the door and they said oh crap i thought we were meeting tomorrow what are you doing here i said oh yeah we are i just wanted to drop this by in preparation and then it was that awkward like well if you're already here do you just want to like come in and that totally caught me off and i was like no, no no i'm not ready i'm not ready uh, uh shoot no just read this whatever so that was a little awkward so i give it to him but i thought it was really clever because i found this short little dvd yeah it was back when we had dvds in 2008 it was this little dvd that was like an eight minute video on how to prep your house to sell so i gave that to him i showed up at the listing prison the next day and they said yeah thanks for dropping that information by uh but that dvd you gave us there's nothing in the box <laughs> I was embarrassed, you guys. I did not get that listing. I just like butchered it on it. So thank goodness we don't have to deliver DVDs anymore. We can actually just send a YouTube link of you talking and not somebody else or something. Uh, so I actually do still periodically, it's not very often, but I have still in the last year hand delivered or had somebody on my behalf go drop them the folder on their doorstep. I think if I know that I'm competing with somebody, if I know in that initial conversation that they are interviewing like, other agents from other brokerages, I have a hand delivered folder with all my stuff in it delivered to their door. I usually just pay somebody in the office to go do it and they do it. Why do I do that? I literally did it just last year. I did it on one of my listing presentations. I had a hand delivered. I still did the email too with the same exact PDF that was hand delivered, but I still had it hand delivered in paper. Why? Huh? Nobody else does it. I had to make an impression and I got that listing. I got that listing and I showed up looking sharp. It was just a professional experience in the phone call. I could tell that that person was, they might've been a C personality. They, you know, they were kind of that personality of, they wanted things perfect. They wanted clean, crisp professionalism. I could tell that. That's why they were interviewing multiple people. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna grab this folder out of my drawer. I already had it printed. And I paid an assistant. We just run this over, put it on their doorstep and say, Clay's excited to meet with you. Here's some preparatory, you know, here's some information to read beforehand. And it went great. I went in looking like the absolute authority because nobody else did that. Nobody else did that. Most of them didn't even send an email. I email it 100% of the time. Yep. And it's simple. That email, by the way, is, is very, you know, thanks for meeting. I'm excited to meet with you. I want to confirm the appointment. By the way, in preparation for this email, or in preparation for our meeting, feel free to check, check me out on a couple of websites. I have redsign.com. I also have claywinder.com, which that website is just essentially my resume. This is who I am. And it is geared 100% for sellers, right? Here's my website and attached is a PDF with some of the marketing plan that I, that I intend to go over when I meet with you. Boom, that's it. That's the email. It's nothing too crazy. Yeah, that one it was. Yeah, yeah. That was like, holy smokes, I got the email, got this cool little packet, right? Yes? And if you can put in the packet, I don't know what you would call it, but sometimes you're asking this question, motivation or improve the, the listings on our house. <laughs> yep, great question. I do not, per se, I do have a little questionnaire at my listing appointment that I'll fill out with them to answer some of those. But a lot of those questions I went over on the phone. Like that page, whatever, that we just went over, I said, make a photocopy of that pre-qualifying questions. I make sure that I go over those very thoroughly on the phone so that I'm prepped. And I don't ask them again in the email, but I do ask all of those questions again when I'm sitting down at their kitchen table. Yeah, good question. Guys, if we beat pre-listing packet, who's doing a pre-listing packet? Micah? Okay, you guys, like, it helps, right? It helps probably, even if it's just an email, do something. Because as you notice by hand, the majority of agents don't do it. And again, the whole purpose of this class is so that you're not like everybody else. We wanna elevate that, be the best money can buy, be worth that 6% commission. And it's little touches like this that add that professionalism. Sound good? Yes, please. 
Yes. You can copy and paste it right now. It's in command. It's under designs. Yep, there is no excuse for you not to have this. It's already made. It's in designs right now. You pop in your name, your contact information, maybe your own personal reviews and hit print. It already has a very generic marketing plan. It already has, it won't have market stats, stuff like that. You might want to add that. Um, but you don't, you can start right now with just, even just an email, start with something. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, maybe with sellers, if you have varying levels of people who actually watch the stuff or read the stuff, you know, is there any way to determine, hey, what did you think about that video or did you read my... Yeah, good point. The truth is, I don't care if they look at it. I don't care at all if they look at it. It's more about them recognizing that step and that process to me. It's the fact that there was a professional preparatory step to the meeting. But yeah, if they don't even click on it or review it, I don't care. Now, if they do, sometimes that can be kind of nice because in a perfect world, the whole point of the pre-listing packet could be that if, which I haven't lately, but there was a time that I did this, if you include the listing agreement in the packet, you might just show up and they say, okay, I'm ready to go. I've already signed the listing agreement. We need to pick a price and what do, you, what do I need to do to my home? Like, let's go. Like they're already sold on you. And I have had lots of listing appointments like that from my SOI where I've already worked with them. They've already known me. It's maybe a second home they've done with me where I roll into that listing appointment. I don't need to sell myself. I need to get into diagnosis. It is not a listing presentation. It is a consultation. It has nothing to do with presenting because they're already sold on me. And those are the most amazing appointments in your entire career. That is where like, it's what it's all about, right? To have that kind of rapport already. Yeah. Okay, turn to page 51. We're going to mix it up this time. I want you to pick a neighbor and share one aha that you learned about the listing presentation conversation. Share one aha. Share one aha. What'd you learn? I just looked at my phone. What is going on? Huh? Yeah, reply and just say, yeah, again, it's a vacant new construction home. The garage code, literally just copy and paste that. Okay, let's bring it back. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Who heard something amazing? Who heard something amazing? Stetson, what's your neighbor share with you? For sure, this is kind of a little bit of a fanfare piece. This is the how to, what just sets you aside, sets the tone for your ability, you know, who you are and what you're all about. What else? Who heard something just awesome? Barry said, just overabundance of value just right out of the gate. So it makes you feel like. Yes, absolutely. You want just dripping with value. Awesome. What else, Caroline? Yeah, for sure. And we should have entire classes on videos. Uh, there are some agents here in the office that do really good where even when they get the lead and they don't know the lead, they'll pull out their phone. Hey, Josh, you just reg registered on my website. You were, you know, you were wanting a price analysis on your home. I just want to let you know I'm a real person. I'm going to drop you some emails. I want to meet. Let's get you that price analysis. Thanks. And they're like texting videos like that. 
same thing here. Hey, Mary, it was great to, to talk to you on the phone. I'm excited about your move to Palo Alto or wherever you're going uh, in preparation for this meeting. Check out this information, the email. Let's, you know, let's get off on the right foot. And I look forward to meeting you Wednesday or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. How many agents actually do that? Like none. That's why we're having this class. We want to be the LeBron James of listing agents in Utah County. Okay, so everyone grab your pens. Grab your pens. This should be an easy one. There at the bottom of page 51, let's write down that action item. From what has been covered so far, what's the one thing that you can do right now regarding your pre-listing process or packet to make everything else easier? What's your one thing? Half of this room could probably just write, create a pre-listing packet. <laughs> the other half of this room might say, I'm gonna add reviews or I'm gonna add an FAQ section or I'm gonna record a video, or I'm gonna get on fiverr.com and have somebody make a little animated video that can be generic because I hate putting myself on video and that's just not my thing, but I'll have a little cartoon character video instead uh, do it. Another part of this room might just say, I'm just gonna create a template email so I have it. Jake's never had a listing, but you should be prepared. You could get one this week. You guys realize the power of it being March 3rd today. Is it today March 3rd? Yeah, March 3rd. You understand to statistically what's going to happen in the next seven and 14 days. You will have more listings flood the market now than we've seen in the last six months. It's springtime. It's going to start in March. April just gets hotter. May's off the hook. And then it all dies back down in June. So this is why we're having this class, by the way. Like March 3rd to teach this class is like absolutely strategic because all of you should have those conversations that you've been waiting for for a year where you actually call your mom or your mom calls you and says, I have a referral for you. My neighbor wants to sell your house. And you're like, oh my gosh, I've been doing the 10-4 for two years and I've never had an inbound referral. Boom, I got one. The first inbound referral I ever got in my career was at month 11. I have been doing that dang 10-4 for 11 months from what they teach in Ignite, calling, calling, calling. And I got business proactively, but I'll never forget it. The first time my uncle Kent called me and he said, hey, I actually have this guy that works at my company and he's really fallen on some hard times. I'm helping him out with some, you know, with his employment, but he really needs to sell his condo. Can you go take care of him? It's like, oh my gosh, my uncle Kent just gave me a referral and I got the listing and it was great. And it was like the greatest moment, but it did take 11 months. And the longer you're in the business, the more and more and more you get. And it's, it's amazing, right? So what is that one thing? You guys all got it written down? Okay. What do you guys, uh, listing consultation? Let's see what time it is. Food here. Guys, we're on track. This is good. Even with all these bunny trails, we're right on track. Stand up, five high fives. Let's do it. We're gonna do lots of these. We got to. We've got to, five high fives. Five high fives. Great, and I'm so glad you're here, dude. Hey, can we just acknowledge something really fast, by the way? So I threw this slide in here. I'm not following the slides, by the way. I'm sorry, you guys. I just get talking and don't follow the slides. Uh, but can you guys believe? So this is this is the most important slide from the vision speech. Let me get this out of your way. So when we were going to family, you remember the vision speech, Gary Keller is regarded as one of the most influential real estate minds in America, right? We've heard that from multiple sources. And one of the things that makes Gary that way is that he is an educator. The dude reads every, there's not a, a, a book out there that he hasn't read about real estate and, and markets and, and economies. The guy interviews everybody he has interviewed on with news reporters really because he's just a market nerd. The dude's a geek, right? So he just geeks out. Uh, these other people, he always ha he has his, his ec ec economists that work with him, uh, that their full-time job is just doing data. But all of that being said, so he spends like two hours going through all of this data. But this is the slide that you need to understand and, and pay attention to in regards to predicting the shift. How many people have been asked in the last just few weeks, really, 
Do you think there's a crash coming? Do you think the market's going to implode? Prices are just so high. Raise it high. Like we've had these, right? Like everyone says, oh, you're a realtor. Dude, Stan, when is the market going to like tank? Like this can't keep up, right? What's your answer to that? Four years and 10 months. Four years and 10 months. Here's my crystal ball. <laughs> Boom, right? Four years. But people really do ask like, okay, hey, you're in realtor. They're going to assume that you're doing your job and knowing the market data. They're going to ask you that question. What do you think is going to happen? You're in real estate. What did you say in like middle of 2019? Yeah, so 20, I was in this room too. So in 2019, we're reviewing the stats, cover up this year, 2019, we're saying, okay, the normal 4% appreciation trend line, by the way, is what we're looking at. We're here, and I knew that we weren't at the top based on this, but I also know I've read the book Shift where it talks about here are the metrics to follow to predict a shift. And there's a lot of economic uh, nationwide metrics that you look like. But the most fundamental that everyone in this room can easily understand is supply and demand, right? This is like, like seventh grade economics, right? If we have low supply, high demand, prices do what? And if we have high supply, but low demand, prices do what? Like it's just supply and demand. So right now we know demand is where? And supply is where? So what's gonna happen with pricing? Like this is just like seventh grade economics, right? And so I got asked that question in 2019, uh, hey, what's gonna happen to the market? And I explained this and I said, listen, the only thing in my opinion that could really like stop this train of growth that we have is a natural disaster or a pandemic. Like it'd have to just like something that would just bring everybody to their knees. I said that and I kid you not, it was like two months later, the pandemic hits. And what did, what did I do? What did a lot of you do? I panicked a little. I had a rental property under contract with Arrive Homes. I canceled my contract. I pulled out my real estate budget and I canceled everything. I pulled up my personal budget. I canceled my HBO subscription. Game of Thrones is over anyway. I canceled all that crap. Like I tightened up. I battened down the hatch. I talked to my wife and I said, hey, uh, we're building a home right now. We may have just made the biggest mistake of our life because we had already closed on our construction loan. I thought the whole world might come to an end because that was my Clay Winder's prediction that a pandemic would be the only thing that could bring the economy to its knees. What happened? I was, I've never been more wrong in my life, right? But that was like, it makes sense. Like I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that. No, because it, it still affected, and we all know why, right? There's a couple of fundamentals. And the, the first thing that I think we all in hindsight can clearly see is by making people stay at home, they actually put more value into like, my home matters. Like if I'm gonna work from home, teach my kids from home, I'm gonna do upgrades. That's why Home Depot stock is like doubled. Like Home Depot is one of the most valuable companies in America right now, because we all started pimping our pads, right? But we also started upgrading our pads like crazy because we had a moment where low interest rates, home values were still super reasonable. All of a sudden, everyone wanted to upgrade their home and everybody became a buyer right? We experienced that. It was like, you list a home. Those people that just bought their home, like in 2019, have bought more homes right now. Like everybody became a buyer. It was crazy. And then we had what we had. So why are we talking about this? Because you're going to get that question asked now yet again. Okay. Pricing is super scary. Should we be fearful that there's a shift? And you guys need to be able to answer that to a level of you don't want to, you don't have a crystal ball. Even Gary, when he got asked this on question, what's going to happen? He said, nobody's smart enough to answer that question. And somebody that thinks they have that answer, you should run from them because they're an idiot. And I think we all need to adopt that. We don't have crystal balls, but what we can say is when you look at these metrics and the most importantly, again, you can ignore all the rest for now. When you look at supply and demand, we have clear, clear data that our households here in Utah far exceed our dwellings. If you guys went to the Central Bank Economic Summit last week, uh, they showed very specific Utah County stats. We do as an office. Shoney shows our stats almost every, every month you know, in team meeting where we look at our, our household growth in Utah is still by far exceeding our permits issued in the state of Utah, whether it's multifamily, single family, apartments, whatever. We cannot build fast enough. We are growing faster than we can build. So that's back to supply and demand. As long as that's happening, there, it will be competitive, prices will go up. But at some point, I think we can all acknowledge at some point enough is gonna be, right?
but I don't know what that looks like. The other really interesting factor, and again, this is me speaking, uh, inflation. I've never lived through inflation. Like, and you'll talk to the old people that went through the 80s and had businesses in the 80s when that was the, kind of the last time we had really bad inflation. And inflation is the single thing that can like wreck an entire country. Like it is, it is dangerous. I have a lot of confidence though in the United States. Um, we're, in, we're raising interest rates. I really pray and hope our leaders have, are smarter than the rest of us and can get inflation under control. But it's rough because even with prices going as high as they are, builders aren't necessarily more profitable because their costs all went up, right? So it's a sticky situation. So when you hear the horror stories of builders just increase my price on my home, those greedy bastards, like how dare they do that? Time out, like look at a builder's books right now. They quote one thing now, 10 days later, that quote's no good and lumber's gone up, concrete's gone up, the price of a tube of caulk has doubled. Like they're 